Testing. Okay, this works. Welcome, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Um, welcome, welcome. While the folks are streaming in, uh, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Ivan. Uh, I'm a contributor at the Lido engineering team. And I'm also going to be your host for tonight. So um, I'm going to walk you through the program of, uh, of our evening. And I'll also uh, talk about a few housekeeping items. So uh, our program tonight consists of three parts. Uh, the first part starts with a presentation by Easy, uh, a keynote, in fact, uh, after which the program will split into two streams. Uh, the first stream will be happening in this room. Uh, we'll have two talks and a panel. And the second stream will be a workshop where uh, Iridin, our community lifeguard, will uh, talk about setting up a DVT validator. So if you're interested in following that, you can exit that room and go all the way to the right on this floor. At the end of the corridor, you'll see a room called Lido Workshop. That's where the workshop is going to be taking place. Uh, it was scheduled to start at 15.30, but we are a little bit delayed. So maybe it will start between 15.30 and 4. At around 5 o'clock, we will have uh, a break. Uh, and um, uh, for around 30 minutes, uh, we can mingle, uh, get refreshments. And we're coming back here for the second part of the program at around 5.30. Uh, during the second part of the program, uh, we will have uh, a talk by Vasily and then two panels. Uh, those will last uh, until around 19.30, and that's when the third part of the program starts. Uh, the third part is going to be the after party. Uh, we don't have Q&As scheduled after the talks and the panels, so uh, you're all very welcome to come to the after party where the majority of panelists and speakers will be present. Uh, that's where you can ask uh, your questions and talk to them. Um, so with that, we're through the program, and uh, I'm going to talk about a few housekeeping items now. Um, when you exit this room, to the right-hand side, you have a refreshment area with uh, snacks, uh, water, and tea. Uh, if you fancy a coffee, there is a dedicated coffee station uh, all the way in the back um, of still uh, this floor, so you're more than welcome to, to go there. And also, when you exit that room to the left, you'll find a photo booth. Uh, we have a photographer on site, so hit her up if you want to have a nice uh, photograph. Um, if you want to use the Wi-Fi, there is a network called Lido Connect, in one word. Um, the L and C are capitalized, and the password for that network is the same as the network name. So also Lido Connect. Uh, we don't have any uh, fire drills planned for tonight, so if an alarm goes off, it's for real. Uh, there are two uh, ways to reach an emergency exit. The first one is on this floor. You go out and then to the right, and then you follow the green emergency exit sign. The second one is on the ground floor. You just go out the same way you came in. So that's it for uh, housekeeping items as well. Um, just want to mention that this is our first ever Lido Connect. Uh, you are pioneering it together with us. Um, and since it's our first, maybe you'll notice some things that don't work that well. So please give us feedback. Feedback is more than welcome. Uh, you can give feedback to me or other folks here in the room with the uh, Lido uh, uniforms or like swags. <laughs> We're all very happy to, to get feedback about today or about anything in general. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker to the stage. Easy, welcome to the stage. The floor is yours. And let's give Easy a round of applause. Thanks, everyone. OK. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, thank you also for taking on the, the job of emceeing our little shindig, given the fact that you just joined Lido uh, like one and a half months ago, basically. Uh, the fact that you've gotten Lido pilled so quickly that you would want to do this, uh, I think, speaks volumes to like, our culture and values. 
um, and how fast we, we onboard people. Okay, so, hey, uh, welcome to the first ever Lido Connect. We're hoping that this is gonna be the first of many events where Lido DAO contributors and the rest of Ethereum and the wider staking communities around proof of stake protocols can get together and think about, discuss, and work together on solving challenges and advancing sta the staking space. Um, to kick us off, I'm gonna go through kind of like a rapid fire history of the evolution of the Lido protocol thus far and examine the impact that Lido has had on Ethereum, especially in terms of the consensus layer um, and staking. Hopefully, by doing this, setting the stage for the wide array of presentations, discussions, workshops, and great conversations that we're gonna have throughout the rest of the day here today, especially given the caliber of people that have joined us. So, I'm Isidoros, uh, everybody calls me Izzy, it's probably easier if you do too. I've been a contributor to the Lido DAO since mid-2021 when I started as Master of Validators. Basically, this role is, exists to help the DAO and the node operators that utilize the Lido protocol to find effective and efficient mechanisms around coordination, operating, working together, and making a more resilient Ethereum. Uh, my crowning achievements so far have been becoming a meme in all of the side channels in Telegram um, and being voted the most huggable contributor. I don't know when that happened. I wasn't around. So, <laughs> as mentioned earlier, I'm going to take us through a whirlwind tour. Yeah, I'll be clicking through a lot of slides with higher APM than some StarCraft players, so try to keep up uh, Lido's protocols journey over the last three and a half years since its inception. Um, and I'm going to try to do this through the lens of the recently ratified Lido DAO mission uh, vision and purpose. Uh, finally, examining the impact that Lido has had on Ethereum and what we, well, DAO willing, uh, may expect to come from that in the coming months. The mission and vision of, of the Lido DAO were voted on very recently, although the proposal, I think, was launched in, in April of this year. But the statements are ones that embody the value of the DAO in terms of like contributors, people that have invested in it, people that devote their time to it, and of course, all of the, the apparatus that exists around the DAO. Um, so people, people that utilize the protocols like uh, researchers that we work with, node operators, and even users. The purpose is to keep Ethereum decentralized, accessible to all, and resistant to censorship. The mission is to make st staking simple, secure, and decentralized. And the vision is that we want to end up in a world where Ethereum is the coordination layer and value layer of the internet. Let's start at the beginning, back in 2020, and examine the events through the, this lens of the, our mission around how Lido intended to make staking simple, secure, and decentralized. So Lido is a liquid staking protocol in Ethereum that was originally incepted or, or designed to allow staking to be accessible, simple, and available on day one of the Beacon Chain launch. That didn't happen exactly, but it came pretty close. Um, in order to support the protocol, a DAO was formed from day one, meaning no company, no foundation, no equity, pure DAO. The DAO didn't and doesn't run any of the protocol's validators. Instead, they're all run by independent node operators who are currently, but more on that later, selected by the DAO. And by more on that later, I mean there are contributors working on permissionless ways for node operators to enter the protocol. One of the proposals just went up uh, on the forums a couple of days ago. Some people even got to see a presentation about this at the uh, staking gathering, and there's gonna be workshops on this a little bit later on today. So in a few words, the principles here are bias to action, favoring pragmatic activism over dogmatic idealism, launching early, making something simple, compelling, and staving off the centralized competition. So here we go. In February 2020, an idea was born for a federated liquid staking protocol. After months of research, discussions with node operators and designs for a decentralized staking protocol, beginning in around July 2020, we get to November, where now we're putting finishing touches on the protocol. Final audits are underway, and the beacon chain launch is imminent. On December 1st, we had the genesis block of the beacon chain, Ethereum's new consensus layer. And owing to decisions at the time, the LIDAR protocol started with a few peculiarities, which kind of drives to the argument that I was talking about over favoring pragmatic idea, uh, sorry, um, pragmatism early on. So due to the fact that there were no OX01 withdrawal credentials, the LIDAR developers needed to come up with a way to have relatively secure way of doing withdrawals. So they came up with a threshold encryption scheme that ended up with computers taking on Kama Sutra positions like that just to find a safe way to do it. The creation of this uh, was eventually deprecated when we could finally move uh, and transition away from OXO withdrawal credentials to OXO1. The process involving regenerating the keys to swapping them out is actually even crazier than that because we added a third device. Uh, the token generation event for the DAO itself, which was launched by a non-LIDO contributor, so permissionlessly launched, on-chain votes to add the initial node operators to the protocol, and reaching 
a total of 16,000 staked ETH on the LIDAR protocol by the end of 2020. This brings us to the end of that year and the beginning of 2021. The protocol's operational contributors are moving to minimize root level governance to the extent that's possible, especially given how much uh, work there was to come in terms of the, the staking and consensus and execution layer interplay on Ethereum, but pushing complexity to the edges by hardening the Oracle set, increasing the amount of node operators using the protocol, and rolling out novel and robust governance mechanisms throughout this year. So starting from the beginning, as you can see, even in like January of 2021, STETH was neither the only LST around at the beginning of the Beacon Chain. In fact, it wasn't even the only STETH around, um, nor was it the, the de facto leader in terms of thought leadership around staking. In March, a few months after the protocol launched, the first node operator onboarding round commences. This is actually the first new addition of node operators since LIDAR started with a genesis of, of five operators. Liquidity incentives were launched by the DAO in order to provide better user experience and continue to play an important role in supporting user liquidity needs until the end of the year. And in May, there was a treasury di diversification round, bolstering the DAO's treasury and bringing in strong strategic supporters for the DAO and its mission in terms of participants that are aligned with the ecosystem, pushing DeFi activity, and making sure that the decisions that are made are ones that are aligned with the network's interests. Somewhere between all of this, the rumblings and eventual, of an eventual role for yours truly, starting with a telegram message that could have just an easily been a scam. <laughs> <laughs> and ending up with probably one of the scariest moments of my life where I basically doxed myself in terms of creating a, a, a DAO job proposal, um, all of this online, as one of the first contributors to sign up to DAO. Thankfully, we don't do things exactly like that anymore. Um, it's a little bit scary and risky, but uh, it's testament, I think, to the risks that a lot of us took on when we started this, this, this project, or at least our personal involvement in this project, um, and the seriousness with which we take all of this. So that brings us to around the, the, the middle of, of that year. So let's look at June to November. The DAO institutes a referral program, which has now evolved into a reward share program. This means not diluting the DAO itself, like LDO and, and the Treasury, and using more sustainable rewards mechanisms, using the actual rewards from, from staking. Uh, and this is in an effort really to support sustained and longer lasting deposits and not have to worry about the deleterious effects of, on liquidity and volatility when a lot of people were um, trading in and out of the new LSTs at the time in order to maximize on the liquidity incentive. So withdrawals were not around at the time, and there was no real robust mechanism for restoring the one-to-one -one relationship that exists natively within staking protocols, right, between ETH and the staked ETH counterpart. Um, and so secondary market prices were very adver adversely affected by this mercenary movement of capital. Later on, we have another onboarding round in 2021. So at the conclusion of Ethereum Wave 2 onboarding, which is actually the third wave, because in computers we start with zero, um, 14 node operators were participating in the protocol. Uh, then a little bit later that month, just shy of two years of operation of the protocol, the first time all contributors ever got together, um, formed around the globe to get together and, and bond, uh, share stories, get to know each other as people, because a lot of us hadn't even seen each other behind colored letters on Zoom. Then we launched EasyTracks, a revolutionary optimistic governance mechanism to allow both the DAO and node operators to execute more effectively and efficiently. EasyTracks is basically a mechanism that allows votes to be proposed by certain whitelisted addresses, like node operators who want to do operational things, like manage their keys, and allows the votes to pass after a certain amount of time if the DAO doesn't vote to, or any token holder basically doesn't vote to reject this motion, sending it back to, to a normal motion, which is a little bit more onerous. Then STETH is added to Maker. Uh, this is indicative of the work that was done to make STETH as useful as a token as possible, um, and kind of an omen of, of the things that were to come once STETH starts getting added to more and more lending protocols, and once lending protocols allow you to both supply and borrow uh, STETH and ETH at the same time. Then we have the third wave of onboarding in November of 2021, towards the end of the year. This onboarding concluded in the beginning of the following year, um, and that brings us to the end of that year. So in 2022, DAO contributors focused on embracing radical transparency. If you'll remember, this is the first year that we had the discussion around self-limiting as well. Um, but we also had the merge, we had PBS, we had uh, OFAC, and a lot of these ki kind of decisions where the values of the protocol and the DAO and the contributors basically that contribute to this DAO that underpin it um, have a very large say uh, in terms of what happens to the network. So let's see how that took shape. Beginning of the year, uh, we posted open objectives and key results for all teams that were working for the DAO. 
and left it up to the DAO to comment and kind of determine, especially given that like, teams are request budget on a yearly basis, whether they think this team is doing a good job or not. Extensive discussions on the forums and on Twitter and probably in DMs and even the ETH R&D Discord uh, about whether to self-limit or not. Um, as you can see on the graph, it seems like at least the first time the self-limiting discussion happened, market share was kind of uh, affected, and it seems like this happened this time too. However, we should also remember that there's a confluence of other events happening at the same time, like Terra blowing up. Um, an open self-assessment scorecard for what the protocol does well uh, and what doesn't and what needs improvement. So obviously self-assessments are not the best way to do this, um, but in general, lighter contributors have always welcomed criticism from the outside. Um, and we've been trying to update the scorecard to reflect that uh, and to be as nuanced and helpful as possible to stakers into the ecosystem. STETH is integrated into Aave in early 22, and you should, they should basically skyrockets. Um, there was a previous contributor in, in BD who I think famously quoted, leverage staking is a hell of a drug. Um, uh, and so the, it's very, very clear what happened. And then a little bit later, uh, due to the fallout from Terra and the adverse effect on the secondary markets price, you can also see the, the effects on volumes of STF being used in Aave. So a few months later, indeed, from the fallout from Terra, there was the first large sustained effect on the secondary market price of STF. Again, there were no withdrawals back then, so there was no natural arbitrage mechanism. Um, users of DeFi protocols in general, STF and contributors to the DAO became worried about the risk of possible cascade liquidations, but really strong Oracle implementations from the DeFi protocols, as well as coordinated, let's say, movements of volumes to, to help prevent liquidations and, and increase health factors in, in potentially um, at-risk pools, let's say, uh, really staved off uh, a possible worst-case scenario. Then, something that began in April of 22, a fourth onboarding round was finally concluded for node operators at the end of the summer, and making this the first onboarding wave where Ethereum client teams joined as, as node operators. So this is something that's been debated quite a lot, but I think if you think about the values that we talked about earlier, it's something that makes a lot of sense. Um, Ethereum client teams generally rely either on own funding right now, the grants that they've received in the past from the Ethereum Foundation, or the grants that they get via the Protocol Guild, but may not have sustainable direct revenue mechanisms. And we think that adding them to the Protocol A not only gives them a very large voice, both in the DAO um, and as operators that can effectively mutiny if they don't agree with any of the decisions of the DAO and they have the power to do so uh, by being node operators, and also uh, by virtue of the fact that it allows them to run clients at a scale uh, which they've never run before. And so we, we've seen in the past, for example, with Chainsafe and Lodestar, um, who when they first joined were performing well, um, but after getting a few thousand validators and trying to run them at scale, they noticed that they had some improvements to make, and within three to four weeks, they went from being like the third best performing client to the best performing client like using a language like TypeScript, and that's, that's pretty cool. So the last few months of 2022, for those of you that remember, were, were pretty bumpy. Um, it starts with F and ends in TX. But kicking off the, the news here is the Tornado Cash, right, and OFAC. So developers associated with the protocol and somehow the protocol itself um, were sanctioned by the US Treasury. Um, this led to discussions around what does this mean for MEV boost? What does this mean for relays? What does this mean for block builders? What does this mean for node operators? Then the most important merge of 2022, where all these considerations are actually starting to take effect, the merge in September, which went amazingly, and huge props to the client teams and the node operators for pulling this off. It's, I don't think I've ever seen anything else like that, both in, in traditional kind of world, um, but especially in blockchains. Uh, and then a little bit after that, Lido Nom contributors started to run open node operator community calls, uh, which are continuing to evolve. Um, and I think it's some of those calls, especially because we get client teams and we get researchers, where some of the most nuanced discussion around staking happens. And we're hoping that with events like this, we'll be able to bring this kind of discussion and this kind of exploration and education to a broader audience. Then we have the Lido DAO's donation to the Protocol Guild following a proposal by the Protocol Guild um, that was approved, and it was the lar largest donation ever made uh, by a DAO to the Protocol Guild. Um, the LEGO Grants organization, LEGO, which created an RFP for teams looking to build sensorability monitors for Ethereum. At the time, we had things like MEV Watch, uh, which basically only looked at the relays that you were connected to. It didn't really determine if censoring was happening, what was the effect of the censoring, how much were transactions being delayed. So we were looking for real measurable impact on censorship. And if that censorship was coming from LIDO, to what extent it was there, and what would need to be changed for that to go down. And we can see, sorry, uh, I cut the slide out. 
But we could see through the, the building of these censorship monitoring tools that Lido not only had more censorship resistance than even some more decentralized staking protocols, um, but basically through the use of uh, discussions with node operators, we ended up resulting using something like Minbid, where node operators are now producing a lot of blocks locally, and this has resulted in really, really good benefits in terms of credible neutrality for the network. So now we're in 2023, where the focus is on implementing integral functionality for stakers in simple and effective ways as soon as possible. The big one here is withdrawals, all while supporting Ethereum's continued credible neutrality. In January, Lido becomes the largest DeFi protocol by TVL. The draft of the mission, vision, and purpose document is shared on the forums. And withdrawals are rolled out as a part of Lido v2 in May, making Lido the first large and only decentralized liquid staking solution at the time to support full native withdrawals at the protocol level. And even at this time, the other native staking, sorry, the other liquid staking protocols that affect this are either super centralized and basically control the validator keys or are using methods that are probably not great at scale, like pre-signed exit messages. Then we had another offsite where we understood that pastels turned out to be everybody's color at Lido. And for those who were there, many memories of contributors jumping into the pool together, celebrating things that I can't mention. All right. And finally, July to November. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm wearing a goose pin. Thank you, Vasily. I'm wearing them one with a knife, I'm guessing, because this is like of all the slashings we catch. In September, a proposal is made for the first open framework of its kind, a way to set strategic goals for DAOs, for contributors, and their, and their communities, and we dubbed it Goose. In the meantime, concerns around the market share of Lido, in the, of the Lido protocol within Ethereum have re-arisen since the summer and have culminated in a mimetic split of aligned and non-aligned crypto Twitter accounts, with Nam de Plume Guart as the most infamous of the bunch. We asked him if he would attend, but he said he only goes to Bitcoin conferences. Not to be deterred by the FUD, the DAO has yet, uh, has yet concluded another onboarding round. This is a resounding success, one that ran from July until basically September. Not, net nine new node operators were added to the protocol, taking the total from 29 to 38. It is now 37 because one node operator has exited. Including more client teams and more operators representing underserved regions in the Ethereum staking ecosystem, such as Latin America and Africa. Most recently, the simple DVT modules and community staking modules were launched. These proposals were made to the DAO, the first of which was already approved. And these modules are going to pave the way for the Lido protocol to become and evolve into an even more decentralized staking aggregator with a swath of independent node operators and permissionless at its core. That brings us to today. So Dev Connect and Lido Connect, and what do we want to do here? At hyperspeed, let's review a couple of like really, really quick facts about the impact of Lido on Ethereum. Everybody knows about staking share. We're apparently soft capped at 33%. It's probably not a terrible problem, actually. Um, is it an effect of Twitter bullying? Is it an effect of exogenous market factors? I think it'd be, it'd be great to discuss that today. Um, there's a great effectiveness rating and a great censorship resistance rating for, for the protocol and its node operators, despite the wide array and the varied setups that they run. And, <coughs> sorry. When we look at the centralized staking kind of share of, of node operators in Ethereum, Contra, other large L1s, where let's say, let's be quite honest, a lot of us probably think they're more centralized than Ethereum is, the numbers are actually kind of scary. So what does this 32% actually mean and how does it translate in the staking distribution? If you look at this diagram, it looks pretty much like how you would think if you thought of an ideal like stake distribution diagram, like the Lido side at least, for a decentralized L1. You're taking the stake, you're spreading it across as many well-performant operators who are quite fiercely independent. Um, at some point, somebody said that the protocol donation was a bribe to the devs so that they wouldn't talk shit about Lido. And then I remember Dapplion on our forums basically saying, you guys don't know how to analyze risk. <laughs> We've since talked about it in person and we made up, so it's okay. Um, and so this is all about coordinating towards positive outcomes for Ethereum and effectively taking stake away from centralized actors at the same time maintaining censorship resistance for the network. I guess this is where I put that slide. So Lido is also about propelling sustainable DeFi dynamics because in order to make Ethereum the economic layer of the internet, you need to make people want to use it to do economic things with it. So what might be next? If we look at Hasu's goose, it boils down to three things. Do more things that Ethereum wants, that's independent node operators and permissionlessly. Decrease the risk to Ethereum, that's dual governance. And you're gonna hear a great talk from Sam a little bit later about that. And last but not least, keep the network robust, maintain its security and censorship resistance. This is something that Lido has been doing from the beginning, and it's baked into its ethos and core, and will continue to do it for as long as it can. 
So Goose is this open kind of strategy setting and goal setting mechanism. All of these goals are striving towards continuing to strengthen Lido as one of the most robust, user-friendly, and network-supportive protocols in existence, deserving of being, in my opinion, a pivotal aggregation and coordination mechanism for the economic security of Ethereum. That's about it in terms of what I wanted to do. I just wanted to lay out what the rest of the day holds for us. There's going to be some amazing presentations, discussions, and workshops, including with people that probably disagree with a lot of what I said, and that's great. That's what we're here to do. I hope you enjoy yourselves. I hope you take advantage of all the incredible minds um, of the people that are here with us today, and don't forget to have fun. Thank you. Test, test. Okay. So uh, thank you, Izzy, for the keynote. Uh, just a reminder, at this point, our program splits into two streams. Uh, if you're interested in setting up a DVT validator and then joining an open discussion about simple DVT, our new uh, staking router module, uh, you're welcome to go to the workshop room, which is uh, outside and to the right, all the way down the corridor. And uh, the main program continues in this room, and I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Mike Nurder from the Ethereum Foundation. Let's give Mike a round of applause. Hey everyone, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Mike Neuter, I work at the Ethereum Foundation and today I'll be giving a talk called A Set Theoretic View of Ethereum Cauteries, which sounds fancier than it is, but uh, yeah, let's get started. Cool, quick outline of what I'm hoping to talk about today. First, I'll start by kind of setting the stage with some notational things. This will be the most boring part of the presentation. But then I'll go through three sets of four cases. And I call them base, extended, and, pacific, and specific. The point of the base cases is kind of to set the stage for the extended and specific cases. So I'll go rel relatively quickly through those. And hopefully, we can spend time on the latter eight cases. Cool. So just quickly, so we're all on the same page, um, I'm going to be talking about these different sets of people. Sets are kind of like these different participants in the Ethereum network. They're users, stakers, holders. We'll kind of go through them one by one. And when we talk about the relation between these sets, we use um, a few different pieces of notation that will come up in the following slides. So the double greater than sign would imply that A is a much larger set than B. Um, the rest of the notation kind of is, is more standard. Greater than or equal to B is the same. Greater than or B, or simply greater than B, and then the approximately equal to B would be um, sets A and B are about the same size or, or relatively similar. And then two last pieces would be the for all notation and the in notation. So don't worry too much. This is um, mostly a visual presentation, but I thought this would be a good place to start. Cool. So let's jump in to the first of our 12 cases. Um, this is what I call balanced. And now we're introduced to our cast of characters. Um, first, we have our users. So this would be people who interact with the Ethereum or L2 ecosystem. They might be buying NFTs. They might be using DeFi. Holders are people who hold significant amount of ETH. Um, uh, I kind of differentiate them from users because they might hold ETH beyond what they just need to use to pay for gas. Stakers are people who participate in the consensus layer. So we have this kind of further subdivision into node operators, which I have three of in this kind of simple case, node operator one, node operator two, and node operator three, and the solo stakers, um, which I represent here. So in this kind of base case, we have a situation where the user base is much larger than the holder base. The holder base is much larger than stakers. So this means that um, a relatively or like less than a majority of the ETH supply is staked, which we have today. We have about 23% of, of ETH staked. And each node operator is kind of relatively equal in size and, and not um, controlling a majority of the total stake. So this is kind of the best case we could hope for. 
And there's, there's kind of good distinction between each of these groups, and we have the, the most decentralized version of, of, this, um, of this kind of naive model. So now we can kind of adjust some of these relations and see, see what comes out. Um, this is case number two, which I call winner take most staking market. And here we have the same relationship between users and holders and holders and stakers. The only difference here is that a single node operator, which is represented by this big circle here, kind of controls maybe a majority, maybe a supermajority of the staked ETH. Um, so this is, this is obviously a worse case than the decentralized one because we don't want a single node operator to run maybe 50 or 66% of the, of the validators. But we still have a situation where the ETH supply is much larger than the amount of ETH that's actually staked. So, you know, in in the worst case scenario, there's still some amount of ETH that um, isn't in the consensus layer and can still be used and um, potentially uh, used to combat an, any attack that this single node operator might try and launch on the network. Case number three, most of the supply is staked, um, but we have more operators. So this is kind of the inverse of the previous case, where now users is still much greater than the holders said, but the staker's, um, yeah, the staker set is almost the same size as holders. And what this means is that almost all of the ETH supply is staked. It'll never get to 100% because people still need ETH to pay for gas for transactions, but you could imagine a world where like 90% or 90 plus percent of the ETH supply is staked. And I think in that world, it would be um, much harder to go from that amount of staked ETH and, and to a smaller amount of the total supply staked. Um, so that's kind of a negative in, in, in those terms, but we do have better, uh, better distribution among the different node operators. So this is kind of differing from the previous case in that node operator one, two, and three are all kind of closer to the same size rather than one of them dominating the others. Cool, this is the last of our base cases. And it's most of the supply is staked and the winner take most uh, staking market. So this is kind of combining the, the two elements of the previous two cases so that most of the supply is staked and most of the stake is controlled by a single node operator. So this is kind of potentially a worse outcome because now not only does one node operator control you know, an outsized influence in the, in the consensus layer, but they also control a, potentially a majority of the ETH supply. So like those two pieces combined, I would say are, are a worse outcome than either of them individually. Cool, so that was our four base cases. Now we'll go to what I call extended cases. And they're extended because they, they kind of focus on some of the more nuances of the protocol um, without, without diving into specifics, which are the last four cases. So case five is kind of highlighting the difference between a centralized staking protocol and a cent or sorry, a decentralized staking protocol and a centralized staking provider. So, um, in this hypothetical world, we have our set of stakers, and there's two centralized exchanges, CEXA and CEXB. We still have our solo stakers, and then there's a pool A. And you could imagine that this pool um, might be composed of many different node operators. And so, even though kind of at a high level, it looks like these three entities have similar influence over the protocol, the centralized exchanges have kind of obviously more influence because they're composed of a single entity running the nodes rather than decomposed into many different node operators. So this is kind of one of the nuances of, of the Lido debate is, is do you view it as a single entity controlled by the DAO or do you view it as 30 different entities, you know, very in, across different jurisdictions? And um, this tries to capture some of that um, nuance. Case six is the relationship between minimal viable issuance, it, minimal viable issuance and solo staking. Um, I'll mostly refer the interested reader to this tweet thread for a discussion on minimal viable issuance. But the idea here is that um, up until this point, we've always said that the solo staker set was non-empty. So solo stakers exist and they meaningfully contribute to Ethereum censorship resistance and decentralization. But there could be a world where the stakers is composed of different node operators, but solo stakers basically can't compete. Um, rather, this, this could be because um, the economies of scale of joining a staking pool are, are so much higher than running a, a solo validator, 
or because the, the hardware requirements of kind of keeping up with um, the extra work that that uh, validator might need to do in a restaking protocol are simply like unattainable for the solo stakers. Case number seven is a single app becoming systemically important and too big, uh, kind of too big relative to other apps. So we have mostly been ignoring the user space up until this point, but you could imagine that this app, this kind of generic app, which I call app X, comes to represent a vast majority of Ethereum users in, um, in the ecosystem. And you know, th while the, the execution layer doesn't directly impact the consensus layer in that like, if the smart contract gets hacked, there's no, um, there's no impact on the attestations or, or the fork choice rule, there still could be a situation where um, Ethereum is, is at risk because so many of the users were impacted by a single application. And there's a kind of still the single point of failure even though it's farther removed from the actual staking layer. Cool, and this is the last of our extended cases. And it takes a quick look at restaking. Um, so there is a world in which restakers come to represent most of the staking set as a whole. And this could potentially add you know, another layer of centralizing pressure, especially if in order to compete on the restaking yield and like in order to actually have expected positive return on your staking, you need to kind of increase the amount of hardware or bandwidth requirements of your machine. Again, this kind of circles back to the idea of potentially pricing out solo stakers um, by, by adding like levels to what it takes to be competitive and to be um, positive. So yeah, the, the point here is that restaking can, can morph the incentives of staking, and it also kind of adds a further layer of, of subdivision in this whole view. In order, so in order to like accurately evaluate the risks, we also need to consider the restaking risks too. Cool, so now we move on to the four example cases. I call them example because I'm talking specifically about individual projects. And I, the, the point of these examples isn't to point fingers or to accuse you know, any, any projects of being malicious, but to show kind of how these, um, these kind of theoretical up until this point discussions could play out in terms of real, real projects. So the classic example of this is the DAO hack. Um, the DAO, this is very similar to, to the previous uh, case seven, which was uh, an app becoming kind of too big to fail. So DAO users came to represent a huge proportion of the overall Ethereum users, and as a result, when the DAO was hacked, there was the decision to, to roll back the chain, which was necessary to avoid impacting almost all Ethereum users in the first place. The second one, which is, <laughs> I guess, highly relevant for this crowd, is the potential for Lido dominance to kind of get beyond um, what, what is truly actually everyone is actually comfortable with. So um, everyone has a different number here, but I, I think we could all agree that if, um, you know, if Lido controlled 80 to 90% of, of all staked ETH and that staked ETH represented 80 to 90% of the Ethereum supply, that could potentially be like huge systemic risk and, and way too much control for a single protocol in, in the um, Ethereum stack. So yeah, the, I kind of asked the question at the bottom here, which is what percentage is too much? Like, the, the vote against self-limiting at 33% showed that 33% isn't too much, but is it 50%, is it 80%, is it 90%? Um, it'd be interested and hopefully can discuss with some of you today after the talk. Um, yeah, case 11, Tyco becomes the hub for most users. So this, um, up until this point, we've kind of ignored L2 users, but you could imagine, you know, based on the, the roll-up centric roadmap that eventually the number of L2 users should hopefully exceed the number of L1 users. Um, but this also kind of creates this, this weird relationship where even though the L2 uses the L1 for security, um, the L1 kind of depends on the L2 in order to like have value and, and to provide you know, real world impact for the users. So if, if an L2 far exceeds the user base of an L1, and then something happens on the L2 contract, or you know, for whatever reason something goes wrong, how do we 
How does the, the protocol react to that? Could that have systemic risk to the consensus layer? I think that's a question worth asking. And especially if, if one single L1 has uh, an outsized influence over the, uh, or sorry, one single L2 has an outsized influence over the other L2s. Um, I chose Tycho as the example here because everyone always chooses arbitrary and optimism, so. <laughs> cool, and this is the last case. Um, thanks for bearing with me through 12 cases. And this kind of takes a slightly different look at the same um, problem, which is up until this point we've thought about if a single project has too much control over a single entity or a single set in our model. But you could also think about if a single entity has control over many different sets, and even if it might not have a majority in any of those sets, the kind of centralizing force of, of having a, a large stake or a large influence over many of the subsets could also kind of call into question the true decentralization of the protocol. So I, I'm pointing, um, not, not pointing any fingers, but Coinbase is the, uh, the kind of easiest example here. So at the staking layer, we have LS ETH, which is the liquid staking ETH that's uh, minted by the Alluvial and the Liquid Collective. We also have CB ETH, which is Coinbase's liquid staking token. At the holder level, we have all the users that are on like, uh, onboarded through the Coinbase exchange. Um, this is especially, especially relevant in, in the US. In terms of stablecoin users, Coinbase is one of the most common on and off ramps for USDC. It's, it's a place to mint and redeem. And they also have a very um, close relationship with the Circle, the company that issues USDC. And then in terms of L2 users, Base has become one of the more popular L2s. It's a really common way for people to get first exposure into the crypto ecosystem, and it's done a great job of, of onboarding a lot of people. So I guess the question I want to leave, um, leave you with in regards to this slide is how do we consider decentralization kind of across the layers um, in addition to within a single layer of the stack? So that's all for me. Um, my parting hope is that we keep Ethereum weird. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for an uh, excellent talk. Uh, our next talk tonight is by Sam uh, about dual governance. So let's uh, welcome Sam to the stage. Hi, can you hear me? Nice. <laughs> so my name is Sam. Uh, I am a contrib contributor to, to LIDA protocol and uh, one of the co-authors of the dual governance proposal. Uh, so today uh, we'll talk about the, the proposal. Uh, so we start with the question of why we need uh, this like complex thing. Then we'll uh, explain uh, what it is, wh what is the mechanism uh, using several like simple scenarios. Uh, then we'll discuss how it improves the current uh, situation and uh, finish with uh, open questions and next steps. So uh, the main thing is that uh, the LIDAR DAO is governed, uh, like LIDAR protocol is governed by the DAO, and the DAO uses LDO token uh, for voting. And the fully diluted valuation of this token is currently uh, a little bit more than $2 billion. Uh, but the total value locked in the protocol, uh, which is ETH of the user users, is more than $18 billion. Given that you only need at most half of the LIDAR uh, LDO token, to push any decision, including stealing of users' ETH, this creates a, like a possibility for a governance attack. Uh, it's given that uh, you cannot uh, like purchase the so, so much uh, LDO using the spot price, but still, like it's uh, it's a really, really, really sc like scary situation, especially uh, considering that one cannot buy LDO, but they can bribe LDO holders or they can, for example, uh, borrow LDO. So, yeah, uh, this is like an explicit attack scenario, like the doomsday scenario, but also there are uh, other cases of misalignment between uh, the DAO and the users, where DAO can vote for some uh, change that is not aligned with the user's interests or values. For example, uh, they can increase fees, 
or a centralized validator set for, I don't know, uh, to like uh, fulfill some government order or anything. So this is, can be generalized as a principal agent problem with the, where principal is uh, the users and the agent is the DAO. So like, this is like the first why we need dual governance. Uh, the second why uh, is that we can improve, uh, like what can be improved is that currently users say, have no say in the, in the LIDAR governance, in the protocol governance, and this increases the chance of the principal agent problem manifesting. And finally, there's, uh, there is food voting, uh, like which is like the most like efficient uh, type of voting. Why I think so? Because food voting doesn't uh, require any coordination. So any other forms of like most other forms of voting does require, do require coordination. But food voting uh, you can do it on your own without coordinating with, with any other like actors. So you just say okay, the the like this. Staking provider that doesn't match my values anymore. I will go to to some other better staking provider, uh, which is really good. It enables the open, fully fully open uh, staking market. The the issue with this uh, form of voting currently is that it only works in the cases of uh, mild misalignment or gradual misalignment, where user users outflow gradually from the protocol. If there isn't a governance attack or I don't know, the governance proposes some really crazy thing, for example, removing all node operators and leaving just one, uh, there will be a lot of, like, a huge outflow of, flow of users, and this might lead to the situation where users don't have the time to exit the protocol before the governance execution time lock is elapsed. Why so? Because Ethereum has withdrawal queue, which has a limited throughput, and also, users might have locked, uh, might have their like stake teeth locked in DeFi or CFI uh, services, which is like uh, really uh, like situation of a high probability because people usually hold LSTs to use this capital in some other like forms of economical activities. So yeah, and uh, this is like the third why. So the food, uh, if if we could Im improve the the safety of food voting, it will be great. So. Uh, and now we come to the dual governance. Uh, so dual governance uh, is an idea that we can have a uh, dynamic user-induced time lock on uh, DAO decisions. Uh, at the same time, it is also a negotiation vehicle between users and the DAO, allowing them to, if, for example, if the DAO changed their, their mind, their, uh, it allows the de-escalation of the situation. And finally, it's a rage quit mechanism. In the case where negotiation didn't yield anything, then users uh, can exit the protocol with the guarantee that they are not subject to the DAO governance until they uh, finish their exit to ETH. So, but let's start with the, uh, like with the um, uh, life cycle of uh, the governance proposal in the like, most happy scenario. And th this is uh, what, uh, like how it happens currently. So the proposal is submitted by some LDO holder. Then DAO votes. Uh, DAO has a voting between all LDO holders. If it reaches the, the quorum and this and the required support, uh, then uh, the proposal is approved. Then there is an ex execution time lock, and after it elapses, uh, the proposal can be executed by anyone permissionlessly. So what uh, dual governance adds? The dual governance adds the ability. Uh, for uh, users, for stakers, to credibly signal their willingness to exit the protocol uh, due to the dis disagreement with some DAO decision, with basically any DAO decision. Uh, so they do this by locking their stake teeth tokens into a special smart contract, which is, we will call Vita escrow. When this happens, DAO execution gets blocked, so any pending or new proposals DAO can vote for them, but DAO cannot execute them. Uh, and while users, uh, and, and yeah, so this is basically a dynamic time lock mechanism. And the more users join the scroll, the more this time lock gets prolonged. So uh, it allows the really active, honest minority of stakers to notice some change in the governance and start increasing this time lock. So uh, it, 
it, it, it, it, it, like it gradually, gradually builds up as more users join. So, but let's uh, now uh, assume that the DAO, uh, for example, there, there is like a misaligned uh, like minority in the DAO, or the DAO changes their mind. Uh, if you, the users have the ability to withdraw from this Vita scroll while the negotiation period is active. Uh, how, uh, like, why they, would they do this? Because the DAO has the ability to actually kill, in, in this phase, uh, the DAO has the ability to kill all proposals. And it is guaranteed that when this phase ends, no proposals are active and no proposals can be executed. Or, so it, it has to be a new voting. So uh, if DAO cancels uh, the proposal, the, uh, the users withdraw from, from the veto scroll and the DAO returns to the normal operation. If uh, the DAO decides to uh, submit some harmful, harmful proposal, proposal once again, the users can repeat uh, like uh, this cycle. So this is like happy path. Uh, but uh, there is also uh, an unhappy path, which is actually also also nice. Uh, it's not like <laughs> it's not a bad thing that this can happen. If the DAO doesn't cooperate, uh, when the negotiation period uh, elapses, all staked ETH that is in the scroll, it gets automatically withdrawn to ETH. And while this withdrawal is in progress, the DAO has no ability to execute anything. So the users who are, we call this rage quit, the users who are participating in this rage quit, they're guaranteed to be, uh, like, to, 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 not, uh, like uh, uh, to not be subject to any go governance decisions, including the pending ones. And after they exit, the DAO execution gets in post, and this like controversial pr proposal is executed. Uh, if while this process is happening, new users who hasn't noticed uh, haven't noticed uh, like the the proposal notice that, they can at the same time simultaneously build up another like Vita cycle and repeat once again. So uh, it's not only first who like uh, who noticed this proposal they are able to withdraw. If uh, sufficient amount amount of stake teeth. Uh, notices this why, why this while this is happening they can uh, exit as well just on the next cycle yeah so the, the, these were two scenarios actually the, there are more governance states uh, uh, I won't uh, go into the deep detail but mostly they are needed uh, first to reduce information asymmetry so that uh, all participants uh, have like uh, like clear understanding what will happen next and also, it uh, prevents some attacks uh, on the on the governance uh, that this mechanism might uh, otherwise create. Uh, so let's now discuss how it actually improves things. Let's start with the principal agent problem. Uh, it is improved by the by the mere presence of this mechanism, because like the DAO now would think twice before uh, proposing uh, something like controversial because uh, users can, uh, can actually block this proposal or, or leave. Uh, and uh, the, it, it also incentivizes the attacks, because now you cannot just uh, steal uh, the protocol TVL, for example, by uh, buying LDO, because the users will leave before you, you are able to execute your malicious change. The problems is that like, it, it really improves, but not like fully improves the situation because uh, not our users are active. So there are uh, passive holders uh, that don't pay attention to anything. There are uh, uh, stake teeth locked in custodies where it cannot be moved out quickly. And uh, DeFi protocols, landing markets, uh, you name it, L2s. Uh, so, and passive users are not protected. So there is no like mechanism like global settlement uh, where like the protocol is basically uh, destroyed uh, paying all, all 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 the debt uh, at least in the uh, there, there is no such a mechanism at least in the current version of the proposal uh, for like user voting uh, users uh, since users can creatively express their intent to leave the protocol uh, as a disagreement with the DAO and since the mechanism supports de-escalation, uh, it gives users leverage in negotiating with the DAO. 
So now they can, like the, the, like the, the, the outcome of the process, it depends on the actions of both DAO and the users. So um, users have more say in the governance, uh, but still they cannot propose changes. So it's not like full-blown full dual token governance. Uh, and uh, for the foot voting, like the obvious improvement is that uh, users who foot vote, uh, they are now uh, guaranteed to, uh, like to, to, to do this safely, even if the like, outflow is massive, outflow from, from the protocol. The things that can still be improved here is that uh, currently there is no triggerable exits supported by Ethereum. So users have to trust node operators that they actually exit their validators. This will change, will change uh, like, I think, either before or... Uh, it, it will be almost simultaneous change with the deployment of, of the dual governance. Uh, so it, it will be here by the time it deployed. Uh, and uh, Oracle currently is not trustless. So LIDA uses Oracle to pass information from beacon chain to execution layer. And uh, it is a committee that is like elected by the DAO, and uh, users have to trust this committee uh, to actually uh, initiate these exits. Node operators can do this, this on their own if they notice, for example, that the committee is malicious. But still, it's like a level of trust. It will be uh, like improved by uh, incorporating the, the zero knowledge oracle, uh, but it's still like in, in, in works. It's not uh, yet implemented. Uh, now let's discuss uh, open questions and uh, next steps. But let's start with like several obvious questions. For example, uh, I get a lot of, of these. Uh, why, if 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 we are like, uh, why we need to introduce such like a complex mechanism when you can just have some committee uh, that will be elected by the DAO or the users uh, or some other like mechanism uh, that will vote uh, to veto malicious proposals. Like, the thing is that, like, the most, the most important uh, thing th here is that this creates another principal agent problem, uh, but agent uh, in this case is, is the committee, and it is not guaranteed to be incentives aligned uh, with, the, or values aligned with the users. So now this committee decides what is good for users, what is bad for users. And users have to trust that if uh, there is some change in the protocol uh, that, are, like, that, that, that doesn't align with their values, the committee will notice that and block these proposals. But this, like, this, this is not how the things work. Like, there, you, you cannot have the, like, the committee that will uh, be aligned with uh, each of the users. This is like the first thing, and the second thing is that this committee has to react uh, to governance changes while the execution time lock is active. It's, it means that uh, we cannot build this committee to be really, really, really sturdy. For example, we cannot uh, have a DAO of DAOs and uh, uh, client teams and, I don't know, a social layer so that they all vote to Vita. They won't be able to do this in time. It like, might require three, four, four months, or even, I don't know, half a year. <laughs> uh, second thing, why we cannot have just time lock uh, on all governance decisions so the users are guaranteed to exit uh, within this time lock. Uh, it's because like, this time lock has to be either extremely long to incorporate any like, um, potential uh, withdrawal queue or it has to look to somehow, uh, there, there should be some oracle that looks at the withdrawal queue size. Either way, it uh, really uh, reduces the efficiency of governance because either it's, it has to uh, like, uh, wait really, really long until the, any change can be executed. And for example, in the case of some, like I don't know, vulnerability, it might be a really critical thing. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, uh, or uh, it, 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 like the, the wait time will be unpredictable and dependent on some exogenous factors like uh, the withdrawal queue size. And also, very importantly, uh, time lock doesn't give users any negotiation power. So it just allows them to leave and it improves foot voting, but it doesn't improve uh, the principal agent problem and it doesn't improve on the, uh, the, the align user alignment. Uh, and the third like, option uh, uh, is like full-blown staked voting. 
where uh, stake teeth can either participate in the governance or maybe uh, stake teeth can uh, ch like stakers can choose the validators or the node operators that w they want to delegate to like the the problem with that is that uh, LST holders like don't hold LST uh, for participation in the governance so they hold LST for yield uh, and optionality and uh, uh, it's we cannot expect users to actively participate in the governance. It won't work. And if we allow them to, to select node operators, there are lots of examples, basically any distributed uh, delegated proof of stake system. If you look at this, uh, the, like the distribution of stake between node operators, it, 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 it gets really, really centralized because uh, users are really bad at um, assessing risk. Users are good at assess assessing yield. But people generally are better at assessing, assessing risk. So uh, they will just like, deposit uh, to the most uh, like, profitable, most like, known and uh, large operators. And uh, like, we will we'll, we'll end up in, with, with much, much worse distribution of stake. That said, uh, there, uh, there, there are like, ways of introduce uh, stake teeth voting, but all of them are really, co really complex and like, uh, like it doesn't fit <laughs> any, any realistic timelines right now. So, um, and uh, the open questions, uh, there are a few of them. Let's start with the parameter selection L2s because they are uh, like a little bit easier to explain. Parameter selection, like, uh, like we, we saw the dual governance uh, system, it's a pretty complex one. It has like lots of parameters, uh, several thresholds uh, that activate this negotiation period and rage quite quit. Uh, time, timeouts and all that, and uh, like modeling uh, all of these parameters and possible scenarios at extra scenarios, it really requires a lot of effort, and this is still an uh, ongoing thing, so it's work in progress. Uh, another like open question is what to do with L2s, because like stake teeth locked in L2s, uh, it can't participate, uh, like easily participate in the in the dual governance. So we either have to trust the governance of the L2s, so to make uh, them the agent of uh, the users, or uh, like uh, maybe it's possible to deploy some, I don't know, governance um, gadgets to these L2s so uh, users can participate right from L2. But it's, it won't be included in the first dual governance iterations because like it, it, iteration, because it, it takes a lot of time. And like the final one, the tiebreaker committee, it's like a hard thing. <laughs> uh, like LIDA has um, a thing that is called um, the gate seal committee. It is a committee that has the power of posing withdrawals in the case uh, some vulnerability is uh, like discovered to stop uh, the, uh, the theft of ETH. And uh, while the rage quit is happening, if gate seal uh, triggers uh, the pulse of withdrawals, it has to be, it has to last until the governance is unlocked, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Because like you know, rage quit happen, can take I don't know two months, and uh, if if uh, if this pulse lasts I don't know five days, then the the attacker will be able to steal the ETH. So in this case, uh, we come to a deadlock. And there has to be some like tiebreaker, and uh, so for this we propose to introduce a really, really large committee that has, it is basically a DAO of DAO social layer and uh, maybe all validators, that has the ability to execute to actually bypass Vita for certain proposals that are approved by DAO, but only in the case where, where there is a rage quit happening and the uh, and the gate seal uh, committee stopped the withdrawals. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have to react really, really fast. Uh, it can, like, the, the reaction time might be even half a year because everything is post, uh, withdrawals are post, and governance is blocked. So there is no, like, urgency apart from, like, uh, the, the fact that protocol is not working uh, as, as, like, uh, as expected, but it's, it's a doomsday scenario already. So, yeah, this is, this is like a um, uh, really, really good question, whether can we do without this committee, because committees are bad, even with a very limited power, uh, but uh, like we haven't come up with any like practical way of avoiding this thing. And the possible next steps, uh, there are lots of them actually. 
a lot of ideas, uh, so we can allow triggering uh, the negotiation uh, by ETH holders uh, because they might be more active. Uh, we might even allow vetoing uh, governance decision by Ethereum uh, holders supermajority. Uh, uh, we can uh, implement delegation of uh, veto power. Uh, we can implement full DAO forking, which is a really interesting thing, but let's, we, we don't have time, time to discuss it. We need invariant by circuit breaker instead of the gate seal committee. Uh, and uh, there is an idea of DAO voter bonding, which basically increases the skin in the game for the governance. Uh, the, all of these ideas are listed in the proposal uh, with more details. So yeah, please, if, if, if you're interest in, uh, interested, take a look. So that's it. Yeah. So we really, really, really appreciate any feedback. Uh, the proposal is still, is still not finished. Uh, so uh, if you have any opinions, uh, ideas, uh, pr like uh, improvements possible, please, please reach to us. There is a thread on the uh, governance forum, and uh, you can reach out directly to me or any of the proposal co-authors. So we will be really, 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 really happy to collaborate. Thank you. So um, next, uh, we will have our first panel of the day. Um, I'll introduce the speakers a little bit later after we set up the stage. First, uh, yeah, great. We are ready to start our first panel of the day. Um, welcome, everyone, once again. Uh, the panel is uh, called a, a little bit provocatively, Why Do You Keep Destroying Yourself? And the panelists today are Cadmel from Lido, uh, Rune Christensen from MakerDAO, Charlie Fang from Agora, and Sam from Lido. So uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause. Hi, hi. Um, what we wanted to talk about and what uh, the title hints for uh, is that many, like um, quite a lot of DeFi protocols, especially good ones, uh, building the mechanics allowing to protect users even by co at cost of um, somewhat like either harming the protocol or dissolving the protocol in order to get users the ultimate right uh, for their tokens for what they've like put in in sorts. Uh, so that's uh, the idea, and let's get it started. Uh, so, uh, Arun, you're like founder of the Maker DAO, which has a really curious uh, emergency shutdown mechanics. Could you uh, explain a little bit uh, what it is and like uh, how could it work potentially, uh, and how would it pr protect Maker users? Just call you. No, just call you. Huh? 
Ah, there it is. Let's try again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So Maker is. Uh, yeah, we are the we are the the basically the oldest and largest DAO, like coming on by like eight years at this point, that uh, governs the world's largest decentralized stablecoin at around 5.3 billion DAI in circulation. Um, and our goal has always been to deliver this extremely robust, resilient, um, uh, you know, source of stability and basically stablecoin product to real people, as many people as possible, because we want to try to use blockchain in a way that actually benefits and provides value for regular people in the real world. And as a part of this objective, from the very beginning, we realized that in this, if this is our goal, if we want to actually create real stability and real value and, and you know, um, protect users maximally, to the maximum extent possible, we had to be able to deal with this like very common uh, entry level issue that that all DAOs, well, most all DAO, most DAOs have, which is the governance attack. So our solution to the governance attack is a type of minority uh, token holder protection, which allows a minority of the MKR token holders to um, to shut down the protocol and allow everyone to retrieve their share of the underlying collateral as as end users of the system. Right. So if an attack happens, you can shut down the protocol then nobody loses any money, everyone gets sort of settled out in the underlying collateral. So in theory, that's like, you know, theoretically, that sounds great. Now you're protected, now nobody can lose money. Um, what we actually realized that is in, in practice, this is actually still not good enough because um, what we've, I mean, the number one thing we've learned in Maker over the last eight years is that this early stage um, perspective that we've had in the crypto industry has been way, way too sort of inward and tech focused. And the entire time, there's been very little focus and very little desire to understand what users actually want and how do we actually get users to use this. So we had a lot of discussion about this before this panel, right? That, yeah, you can build some amazing, secure, fancy tech that's great in theory, but if you can't get it adopted, then it's actually all that effort is pointless, right? Because you're actually protecting nobody since nobody's using your thing. Um, so that's something I think is extremely important to keep in mind. And this is what the space at this point needs to, to push more, that like we can't just stay out in theory. We've got to focus on what's real. How can we find that kind of middle ground where we can deliver the security of the blockchain as a Trojan horse, right? Where you, you, you get what you actually care about as a user, which is absolutely not security. Nobody, nobody cares. Nobody thinks about that. Nobody thinks about decentralization. Everyone who cares about that stuff, they were in crypto three years ago already. We've exhausted the supply of, of that type of user long ago, right? And we need to focus on normal people who absolutely do not care about nerding out about some tech security stuff, right? So that means the tech, the security has to be attached on the back end of something that's actually interesting. And it, cannot get in the way of that, right? You can't have the security measures, the tech, the fancy theory impact the user experience. Because again, then what happens is you end up protecting nobody because nobody will use your thing. I see, thank you. Uh, like people who care about digitalization and uh, security of cryptography and digitalized finance protocols are mostly in this room, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, with all caveats uh, of uh, emergency sh shutdown inside, there are different like designs of protecting the user still. And uh, one of the very curious one is uh, forking mechanics, uh, which uh, Nounce DAO has implemented, and uh, Charlie has helped to design the list. Could you cover a, a bit what, what the forking mechanics of Nounce is and what it does itself for? Yeah, oh, happy to. Um, I can't take too much credit for the design of the, the noun style fork. Uh, that's credits to the Verbs team there. Um, but we at Agora build a lot of governance tooling for different DAOs, uh, and we get the privilege to kind of see different mechanisms or different ways of approaching kind of minority protection or uh, kind of, in this case, I think for nouns, the, for those who don't know what nouns is, it's a NFT project that does a lot of public goods. Um, it's famous for its kind of one noun a day uh, forever. And 
it's governed by whoever holds an ounce. Um, and it's quite a simple concept, but over time, as with most communities, you start to realize that there are different stakeholders that starts to emerge. And it's no longer a homogenous group of people, right? There's people with different beliefs, different interests, and then different incentives as well as uh, how you should run the pro project starts to diverge at some point in time. And then it begs the question of, well, how do you protect the minority? Um, so the mechanism that Nouns, I think it was a couple months back that uh, with the V3 um, released was this forking mechanism that allows kind of a minority, uh, as long as you have more than 20% or as long as more than 20% of minority bands together, you're allowed to fork the DAO into kind of a perfect replica, if you will. Um, and I think the intention here is definitely minority protection, but one of the interesting things of implementing such a, uh, such a mechanism is that it creates I don't want to use the word threat, but it creates the ability for, uh, it actually kind of, I think, ends up having more dialogue or creates more dialogue now, right? Because previously, if you are a, I guess the word is kind of like an oppressed minority, let's say, um, as the majority, unless I believe you have a real chance of getting to 51%, I could kind of ignore your thoughts, right? But now, with such a mechanism in place, it kind of forces me to engage a dialogue because it does pose a serious consequences to the rest of the DAO. So um, similar to what Rune said, there are some, in practice, uh, there are some uh, interesting dynamics that plays out afterwards. I see, thank you. Uh, and uh, as for later DAO, and that's like maybe two prongs, but um, there are two kind of designs, two, two, two kind of security features built in into voting and DAO setup. One already built in, which is objection phase, and the second, which uh, Sam has talked about, uh, has talked about, is the dual governance. Uh, Sam, could you cover what uh, objection phase thing is and the gist of what dual governance is about for ones who, who just joined? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, objection phase is yeah something that already working is like a, the mechanism that uh, replaces basically the execu execution time lock. With, um, with a phase where uh, the voters can only vote against the proposal. So it's basically uh, an execution time log with the edit ability to, to, to reject the proposal. Uh, yeah. So it, it gives more time for honest DAO members or slow DAO members to notice that something is going to pass and to, to act against. Uh, so this is a really simple mechanism. Uh, surprisingly, we haven't found it in the wild. So it was like, yeah, really curious thing. Why haven't anybody implemented this before? Uh, or maybe uh, someone has, like just we didn't know about that. Uh, and the dual governance is uh, like uh, the way for, for stakers to uh, first to uh, int introduce a dynamic extended time lock on governance decision. Uh, uh, then negotiate with the DAO if they are against this proposal. And if these negotiations don't yield any positive result to rage quit uh, the protocol uh, while the governance is blocked. So this is basically the gist of it. Uh, it's not a forking in, in full because, uh, uh, because the protocol has two sides, actually. There are two types of users. There are stakers and there are node operators. And this mechanism doesn't allow node operators to leave. Uh, like, this would be a really, 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 really nice thing, in my opinion, if we, uh, uh, um, if we could, uh, like, build this coordination mechanism for, the, like, the full fork. Uh, the complexity is that, first, this coordination is not a simple one, because you have to match users with node operators, uh, and uh, all, all of the parties should participate in that. And the second one is that, like, there are some technical limitations, uh, we have to have the like the withdrawal contract uh, upgradable, uh, withdrawal credentials contract upgradable, and there is no way to repoint validators to another withdrawal credentials right now in Ethereum. So this like uh, this stays in the way of implementing this like the full forking mechanics. Yeah, and this is not like a, a poison pill either, uh, because it doesn't uh, protect users who are passive. So you have to be active uh, in order to exit. Uh, so global settlement will be uh, like poison pill because this global settlement was an option uh, that we considered. Um, 
and probably we like we should consider it implemented in, in, in the future uh, just right now we are uh, like uh, while we don't have uh, like bytecode verified contracts and ossified critical parts of the code for example stake teeth minting uh, uh, like we uh, we don't think it's uh, it's it's like we think it might might create an attack vector on the protocol uh, if there is some vulnerability in the in the token mechanics, so we we are almost sure there is no like we are sure there is no no vulnerability. But you know vulnerabilities uh, they uh, it might be even uh, like in, like produced by some compiler bug, so it happened uh, in the wild. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so usually any security measure uh, you have built in uh, cost you something. And uh, usual question or one gets asked uh, is basically whether hadn't you solved with somewhat easier or whether you had like uh, had to go more complex way. Uh, so that's that's the next question for like protocol designers. I do uh, on the panel. I do have. Uh, Arun, could you cover what, what kind of solutions like have you passed on on? Um, Energy shutdown, or is the energy sh shutdown good enough uh, in your view? So, what, what kind of easier solutions, uh, uh, like hadn't cut it, or what was the design considerations here? Yeah, my opinion is that you want to build a system that is obviously as simple as it can possibly be, because that just inherently gives you not only resilience but also growth potential, because it's it's safer, it's less likely to break, and it's easier to, uh, to market and explain. So if we could just build super, super simple smart contracts, that would be amazing. Unfortunately, the next thing is you've got to have the features that people want. And when it, with stable coins, this quickly becomes a bit of a nightmare because it turns out that maintaining the stability of something to, the, to a you know, real life, sort of real world um, unit of account is totally not a simple challenge at all. So there is just this, um, this like massive requirement in terms of, 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 you know, you've got to have a lot of complexity to deliver the feature people actually cares, cares about. Because again, I mean, without growth, without users, if you're not doing all this cool stuff for the sake of some real people that are going to use it, it's all pointless, right? And basically, I think then the last the last sort of pillar of this is you have to then make sure that all of this is sort of fundamentally verifiably secure, right? You can't allow it like sort of like probable edge cases where people lose money or get screwed over in some way that, you know, they wouldn't expect if you assume that they're not going to be experts and sit down and read a book about it or something, right? Um, and where, where I'm going with this is that what this means is um, often you do have to, like, like basically if you have to choose between, you know, a simple solution um, that is more secure, but as a cost of that, sort of, again, like, impedes adoption in some shape or form. Unfortunately, you got to go, you got to add more complexity to make it smooth and make it, make it adoptable, because otherwise your simple solution may as well not be a solution at all, right? Um, and I was just talking about this earlier that emergency shutdown, this poison pill approach that we've been, we have thought that was the final and, and complete solution for the past eight years. But the reality is it, it isn't if you consider large enough scale, right? So at small scale, it's fine for uh, some, you know, medium sized financial piece of infrastructure to shut down. Like it wouldn't be a complete disaster if the maker protocol shut down tomorrow. It would suck for a lot of people, absolutely, especially for me, no doubt, but it wouldn't like cause like massive harm on like a global scale, right? But if you then assume that Maker was a thousand times more adopted globally, right, then an emergency shutdown would be maybe as bad or worse than something like, you know, the complete meltdown of a, of a financial system or like terror collapsing or something totally crazy causing massive, massive losses, right? Because now we're talking about a systemically important financial infrastructure, basically like ceasing to appear, which is kind of like suddenly no airplanes, no airplanes are flying anymore or something like that, right? Which is really like, it's disastrous when you reach a large enough scale, right? So you can't allow that kind of outcome to be built into the protocol. 
and be available for someone to trigger at will because it's, it's a DAO and it's decentralized or whatever, right? So we gotta come up with a solution that gives us what we need from emergency shutdown, from the ability to basically stop bad actors and put the system back together so that we can remove those bad actors and actually keep everything running with no impact on user experience. Uh, and that is uh, not exactly easy, but we do basically have a, a design for this that we will implement as the, the last stage of the end game plan, right? This big overhaul that we're doing with Maker. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and it all comes back to the idea that we want to really grow, we want to really bring blockchain to the real world, and we want to give the best measure of security, of transparency, of stability that you possibly can with blockchain. We want to make sure that it's provided to as many people as possible, and that we're not being irresponsible in setting up a kind of ticking time bomb, right, where there are features in this system that, like there are situations where the so-called security features become the vulnerability itself. Thank you. So basically, in a sense, uh, like not the designs have been abandoned uh, b uh, in favor of current uh, emergency shutdown, but the emergency shutdown doesn't cut it for the scale maker is shooting for. So that's <laughs> another, another stage. Uh, and as for a forking, uh, which Charlie has, uh, you've talked to, uh, talked about, uh, like that sounds pretty complex. Uh, basically, the question is why hadn't you had something like smaller or easier? And what's the actual like design idea? Like wh why exactly f f forking is good for nouns? Let's say why why, did, why is it a good idea? <laughs> well, I guess we'll still see kind of uh, if it's a good idea uh, as. Uh, <laughs> the governance experience experiment is kind of playing out in, in real time. I think one of the, um, for those of you who don't know nouns, but if you're interested in governance, I'd recommend you to check it out because it's never not boring. Uh, there's a, it's, it's constantly experimenting with different mechanisms and different kind of governance innovations, which personally fascinates me a lot. Um, and when it comes to the forking, going back to kind of the original uh, intentions of the fork, I still think it's, both noble and important, which is to protect the minority or protect the users at the end of the day. Uh, but I think one of the things that is perhaps un unintentional is the fact that transparency and accessibility cuts both ways. You can't be accessible to just the good players or the good actors, right? Um, you could either make it accessible or not accessible. Uh, and as soon as you open the transparency and accessibility, Kind of open it to all. So what ended up happening that was interesting to observe is that yes, it allowed the uh, what I would call kind of the honest minority to um, fork out of the DAO because they were not aligned or they had different beliefs. Uh, those stakeholders. It also uh, gave an opportunity of attack vector for perhaps the bad actors or the the dishonest uh, minority, where they realized that there was a difference between book value and the market price, and there's an arbitrage to be made. Um, and now we're seeing kind of the real life governance experiment play out of, well, how do you deal with this attack? The, the, the practicality is quite a bit more messier than I think the, uh, than, than the theoretical. So um, now we're kind of seeing nouns initially uh, potentially actually try out something like a poison pill. Uh, we kind of saw the, the treasury maybe um, either trying to accelerate spend or spend the treasury down in a way that it's no longer kind of uh, profitable for the arbitrager. So, there's a bit of that, and now we're kind of seeing what we realize is maybe 20% is not the right number. It got lowered to 10% at one point in terms of the, uh, the percentage of minorities that's required to create a fork. Uh, now there's a proposal actually live right now about like, should we increase this to 30%? Um, we'll yet to see what is the magic number or if there is a magic number, um, but there's probably some degree of equilibrium where hopefully you're protecting the minority, but not at the cost of too much to the majority. So there's an interesting trade-off here of how to think about this. I don't have all the answers, but it's, uh, it's very fascinating to learn from. I see. Thank you. Uh, and Sam, basically, the short version of the question, what easier designs have you abandoned? And, uh, let, let, let me pick one particular. Uh, what, do, like, can, can we uh, get rid of dual governance and just uh, s set up a multi-seek? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I get it a lot. Uh, uh, like, the thing is that uh, of all the designs that we, uh, that we uh, like, considered, including the multi-seek, 
uh, there is no like only dual governance in or or more complex systems allow two things first give users more agency so not that multi-sig decides for the users uh, what's good for them what's not uh, but give give users the agency and uh, and uh, at the same time give them the leverage of negotiation with the DAO and give them the safe way of leaving the protocol. So like, if you want the combination of three things, of these three, three things, then like the dual governance was like the simplest, the simplest mechanism we arrived at. So yeah, it, it, it is complex and I would really, really love to have something uh, much more simple. Uh, but yeah, uh, it, it, like any simpler mechanism doesn't fulfill these three uh, like um, um, yeah uh, goals, and and I think all of them are really important. Uh, foot voting is really important because it's the most powerful mechanism out here, of all the mechanism uh, me mechanisms. Uh, I mean voting mechanisms. Uh, the agency is important because uh, like. Uh, why would you decide what is good for users and what is bad for users? Uh, like, uh, given any any actor this power of decision, like it basically undermines the whole idea of of what we're trying to improve. Because right now, like the LDO uh, holders decide what's good for users, what's not, and we are trying to like improve this because it creates a principal agent problem and introducing any kind of committee just adds one one more principal agent problem so you 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 just multiply agents and this is like this is not the solution in my opinion <laughs> so b b basically you should uh, in design you're striving to get li like more agency and more principle but not um, issues between those uh that uh, basically this consideration uh, gets me back to the question where we're like the solution you do have and that uh, gets back to the first uh, thing Arun has mentioned whether the solution you have right now kind of cuts it and uh, what like the next potential stage could be uh, so Arun, could you cover what next like generation of uh, user protection uh, in MakerDAO could look like well, so uh, I'll just I'll just briefly explain the whole like I mean basically what we got coming up. That I, I guess, as I said earlier, the the end stage is basically the best possible solution we could come up with that was as simple as possible, and, but provided this complete and sort of full and uniform protection um, at the level of security and at the scale we want the system to be able to operate safely at and then from there with all of those pieces in place then the question is how do we distribute all this great and fancy theoretical security out to real users in the real world right and so uh, one thing we're doing in a couple of months is we're rebranding maker so there's going to be a, a rebrand so dyn mkr will stick around um, but the project as a whole will get a new and more streamlined brand that is basically Slightly more thought through than you know. Any teaser? What the name would be? <laughs> uh, it's not. Uh, it's not finalized. It's not revealed yet. <laughs> but you'll know when it is. Hopefully, we will. We'll make sure people know. So, uh, and but then a, a key part of of, of uh, what's coming after this rebrand, right? Which is basically changing Maker Endgame from this nebulous. Here's a bunch of features and so on to more of like a feeling. Uh, uh, you know, something that's a little bit more simple and doesn't mean you have to read 500 pages of super complicated stuff to feel like you know what's going on, right? But the main feature that's going to be available is sub-DAOs, right? So sub-DAOs is actually somewhat relevant to like the forking mechanism of nouns, for instance. Like this idea that there are multiple different subgroups and instead of trying to put everyone together in one giant monolithic pile where they have to fight it out in, you know, super complicated multidimensional governance, you create many smaller DAOs and you sort of, um, uh, you know, indirectly connect them to the, to the main DAO and then you allow them to specialize in different areas and you allow them to fail. So people who believe in, have different beliefs about 
you know, real assets is the future, or real assets specifically in Latin America is the future, or go all purist, all out, you know, all in on ultra decentralized purist, decentralized collateral. That's where the money is, so that's where the opportunity is. Instead of having to decide that on a sort of a, this top-down basis for the whole DAO, individual groups can, can make those decisions individually. Um, and, and then some of them will make the wrong decisions, but that's their own, that's kind of their own, you know, they're putting their own capital, they're putting their own, um, um, you know, uh, that's fair, money where the mouth is. Sorts. Yeah, so, so, and then finally, all of this is distributed out to the final, like the end user of the system, right? The, the, the holder of the new stablecoin get these subbed out tokens for free and get to choose what do I want to bet on? What do I think is the secure solution, right? The thing that's going to deliver stability, is going to deliver value. So in this way, what, this is really, I mean, the essence of how we're trying to like gamify and make interesting these fundamental questions of security and user resilience, right? By being like, look, it's not a boring theory thing. It's like a question of what do you believe in? What do you want to be a part of? You know, are you willing to, to take risk and, and make decisions on behalf of others, but also, you know, uh, be on the line if there's losses, but get upside if there's advantages, right? And, and um, hopefully this means that we can actually also draw users more in to the underlying questions of what's really going on, what is it really that makes this stuff stable? Um, or if they don't want to, just make it really easy and fun to adopt and get some yield and make sure that, again, a lot of people actually end up benefiting from all of these uh, features and advantages. I see, thank you. So basically, the question for, uh, the, the, the answer is decentralizing, the already decentralized thing. So get, get it more diversified uh, of, of sorts, which brings complexity. So looking forward for next stage for, to see how it balances out with uh, user adoption and ease, like ease of understanding and ease of use. Uh, and uh, to the same vein, uh, you mentioned, uh, Ch Charlie, you mentioned that uh, like right now, one of the questions before announced DAO is what the threshold for potential forking could be. Uh, like maybe you would be looking to some automatization of uh, like figuring that thing out, or maybe there is some like more higher order solution you are looking for. So maybe there is like better alternative than just setting up the number by in a vote. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll see. <laughs> uh, in many ways, I think the experiment is still kind of playing out. And uh, again, credits to the Verbs team, and there's a bunch of different players and nouns that are kind of discussing different options. And the changing, adjusting the fork, uh, sorry, the threshold of the fork is just one of the levers, I suppose, that's being played around right now. There's a couple other suggestions of, for example, do you spend the treasury faster? Do you create some mechanism like a burn mechanism? Um, but there are all different ways to, I guess, close, I guess, the arbitrage or the, 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 the flaw that was created by um, uh, the fork mechanism. And I think for me, it goes back to kind of like the purpose of, to me, a good governance system is the ability to kind of balance trade-offs of different stakeholders uh, across the DAO uh, as a collective. Um, and for nouns, there's definitely multiple stakeholders. I think for DeFi, it's probably even more true where you have users, and let's say you have token holders. Um, and the reality is both sides kind of need each other, right? You can't just, like if you imagine kind of the thought experiment of playing uh, a DAO where you have one stakeholder uh, have all the power to the extreme, in no case does that ever work. Um, like you can't have, a, uh, I mean, I guess you have an ossified protocol that has just users, but the argument there would be that eventually it'll get outdated, some other protocol will probably come along. Um, if you have a protocol where it's just token holders, um, then there is no value being created that the users are creating. So there's an interesting kind of uh, design question here of how do you design a system where it will continuously balance the incentives of the different stakeholders, hopefully without, I, I think going back to the sentence of like, if there is something exploitable, it will eventually happen. <laughs> so, um, and you could allow social norms to kind of carry you for so long, but it'll likely not carry you to last the test of time. Uh, so codifying these kind of mechanisms that uh, allows these different stakeholders and their incentives to be balanced properly is, I guess we'll see how, how that plays out. I see, thank you. Uh, 
uh, and uh, some question to you. Uh, do you see like current stage of design of dual governance as an ultimate say to protecting stakers from like whatever risks uh, talking voting uh, gets to govern? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> so, uh, like, there are several like global directions uh, in which we can imp further improve the protection. The first one is like, like the ultimate goal. To be, we, we, the, the ultimate goal for us, like, is to to reduce the governance risk. And like, the the most efficient way of reducing the governance risk is, is to reduce the governance. So, the first like global and very important direction is. Uh, modularization and gradual classification of the code so that governance uh, cannot change uh, the parts of the protocol that are or either cannot or it is really 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 hard to do for example it requires I, I don't know one year time lock to change the code that is really at the at the core of the protocol so uh, this is like the first direction and it probably requires bytecode verification of the code because if, if something cannot be changed or can be changed only in a year, you want to be really, really sure that it doesn't con contain any vulnerability even if it's generated by the incorrect uh, compiler pipeline. Uh, this is like the first global direction and the second global direction is improvement of uh, protection of users, uh, of foot voting. For example, right now we don't have like the protection for passive users. So there are some level of protections, uh, protection because like the, the minority can extend the time lock for governance decision and this gives more time for passive holders to notice or maybe for active holders to like socially amplify the information uh, about the bad governance decision so they, they can actually, uh, the passive holders, holders can react. But it's still not like uh, the, the ideal level of protection. So something that allows passive holders to be protected. It, it, be, it might be a delegation of the Vita power or it might be a poison pill. Uh, uh, this is uh, like one of the potential research directions, I think re really important ones. And uh, uh, finally, there, are, there is like the idea of uh, the full DAO forking, which is, uh, I really like it, uh, but like, yeah, it, 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 it requires, uh, it requires uh, a lot of effort uh, in research and implementation. Got it, yeah, and forking sounds fun, uh, unless it happens, <laughs> at the very least. Uh, so I wanted to ask one more, like a closing question maybe, uh, to all of our panelists. Basically, everyone in DFI, uh, everyone like in, Mm, in protocols which uh, came out to be successful, came out to, uh, to get user adoption and user trust ultimately, are working there and hard, are like devising uh, very complex mechanics uh, to like protect users to get something happening in decentralized in novel way. So my main question is, uh, why do you like personally or your team in general uh, put so much effort and put so much at, at risk for the thing you're building in so hard uh, and allowing the, like the uh, external forces uh, and the users to say okay uh, whatever you built is like it doesn't doesn't cut it I want to break in uh, I want to go out uh, wh what all this effort is for what 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 are you for working for so hard yeah, I gotta be honest that uh, I would, you know, it's a bit of the sunk cost fallacy <laughs> for me. <laughs> that when I first got into DAOs, right, I mean, what I was promised eight years ago was a DAO is basically is you just kind of you write a white paper, you maybe like code up some code, and then like the free market will take care of it, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Apparently that's wrong. <laughs> And uh, now we're like into deep and there's like $5 billion at stake and we need to find a way to make that system automatically keep that secure for, you know, for all eternity. And apparently that takes a lot of work. But you know, that's also why we call our big, the sort of the code name, right, for a big overhaul uh, is Endgame. Because the point is, this is supposed to be the final effort to fix it once and for all. Uh, after which we can relax. So I guess I work really hard, so in the future I would not have to work so hard. I see, I see, Charlie. 
Oh, that's a good answer. Um, for me, uh, I come from a fintech background, so what got me interested into uh, the, the space in the first place was actually DeFi. Um, and then I quickly realized that uh, I just found DAOs so inefficient. Like, it, if you compare it to kind of traditional organizations, um, maybe that's a taboo subject to get into, but uh, coming from that side of the world, it, it feels like if DAOs are going to be the, uh, the promise of the DAOs are going to be uh, uh, that, that end-all be-all or that, that organization that could actually um, provide that transparency or that level of accessibility and all kind of the good things that DAOs could potentially provide, it needs to get a lot more efficient. Um, and that's what pulled me into building governance tooling uh, and realizing that if we don't uh, um, build both more practical tools as well as kind of think more deeply about how these mechanisms will play out, uh, it, I don't think it'll work out very well. So um, that's what got me really into uh, kind of the governance space specifically. And then in terms of when I look at uh, kind of like maybe DeFi or um, the products around crypto as a whole, the coming from a fintech background, I think one of the things I really do believe in is the, the idea where um, so much of our lives is revolves around the financial system at the end of the day. Uh, and having sovereignty over kind of your effectively money um, gives you also sovereignty over your time, right? That's kind of the fundamental idea where I could work this year and maybe portably, like I could port time to take a break next year. Um, if that bridge, if you will, kind of disappears, then well, I guess you don't get that anymore, so. And Sam, do I, I look into like, get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, why I'm working so hard on, on, on this, like, to be honest, I'm just, like, the answer is really simple. I'm scared to shit about the, what the bad outcome can, can be of an attack on the DAO. And, like, this is, what actually keeps me awake up at night. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, also, like, um, like reducing risks for users, even at the expense of the governance, it's not really an expense for the governance. Because, like, when you re decrease the redemption risks, it, like, it makes your, like, protocol so much more trusted and valuable that the upside is, like, it outweighs any possible like downside decreasing in governance power and all that. So there is a bad governance power and there is a good governance power. We want to decrease the bad governance power, uh, that is like the ability to uh, wreck the users uh, as much as we can. Uh, and and the keep, keep the good, good governance power, which is like spending treasury, maybe improving the protocol, uh, improving its mechanics, mechanics, but yeah, there is a balance here and yeah, it's, we, we are yet to find it out. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining the panel. Thank you for listening. And I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you, panelists. It was awesome. And uh, thank you all for joining uh, the first part of uh, our day uh, finishes now. We're having a break. Uh, we should be back here, for those of you interested in part two, at 5.30. So in 20 minutes from now, we are starting again uh, with a presentation by uh, Vasily on the overview of proposed changes to Ethereum staking mechanisms.
Perfect.
the cutoff. Oh. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are gradually starting the second part of the evening. Thank you all for uh, coming back. Um, the plan for the rest of the night is as follows. Uh, first, we will have a talk uh, by Vasily uh, about an overview of Ethereum staking mechanisms. Uh, then we will have two different panels, one after the other, and we're aiming to finish here at around half past seven. After that, there will be an after party, uh, but it's important to note that the after party will be in a different building. It will be in the restaurant next door, um, so you'll have to leave this building the exact same way you came in, and then walk for around 30 seconds to the building next door. Uh, there will be food, drinks, uh, view of the Bosphorus Strait, um, so I hope, uh, hope you will enjoy it. With this, uh, let's get started with uh, our next speaker, and uh, uh, let's give a round of applause to Vasily. Hey, hey. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, coming here, and I'm sorry for the delay again. Uh, but uh, um, it wasn't 20 minutes. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, the potential changes to Ethereum staking protocol. Um, uh, somewhat arbitrarily selected among the like the ideas flying around IAPs and stuff like that, um, you know, based on uh, impact on staking and Lido, based on impact on protocol and like. Uh, on LIDO protocol um, and uh, how much work would it be to incorporate this change um, and uh, on possibility to actually be implemented. Uh, um, so uh, a lot of ideas that are floated around are not in this talk, uh, only that one that seems to me like they're the dead gazed or uh, uh, like important to uh, talk about. Um, so, um, my name is Vasily. I'm uh, uh, in, on research in LIDO since like uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I uh, uh, am a co founder, uh, used to do a lot of test stuff, but now I'm um, you know, mostly thinking very hard about things. Um, so, these are the things I'm thinking about, among others. Um, the thing I want to talk about today is enshrined. Propose a bill of separation, uh, max effective balance bump, uh, withdraw initiated exits, um, uh, stake share soft to limit, and uh, tired staking ideas that are getting floated around. Um, I actually had to like um, rehash the presentation based on talks that were on this on Dev Connect the last three days. The like uh, atmosphere changed very hard uh, these days, uh, very fast. Uh, life comes to you hard, so. Um, uh, this might be a bit rough around the edges, but uh, let's go on. Um, uh, this one, right? So, um, the one that is probably uh, one of the most important things uh, to change, uh, like potentially change around Ethereum, is enshrined pro uh, proposal builder separation. Uh, so, uh, what is it? Um, uh, basically, right now there is a separation between proposers, people who are um, combining transaction to block, and builders, uh, um, uh, like proposers who are like proposing a block for a consensus to uh, um, be attested, and builders, people who combine transaction to block. Uh, that is done through like a third party software, not built in protocol, uh, MEV boost mostly, uh, almost exclusively. Um, uh, which is an off-chain system based a lot on the reputation and trust um, that uh, allows for auction for MEV and uh, allows for stakers to earn MEV uh, and uh, uh, searches, uh, people who search for me, MEV also extract some value from it. So, um, But there is a desire uh, to handle MEV in protocol for many purpose. One of the uh, important purposes that would allow to uh, burn or smooth MEV um, so that basically uh, ad holders get like in a way more income 
instead of just take us uh, if you may talking about burning or that uh, you can uh, reduce the uh, smoothing effects of big stake and allow uh, small stakers to be on the same footing as big stakers if you're talking about smoothing. Um, it also has uh, a very interesting effect in reducing the uh, like legal and uh, ethical attack surface for uh, block builders, which is also uh, could be very good for decentralization as well. Um, it's very hard uh, thing to implement Enshrining things are hard. Uh, MEV, um, uh, basically, aware protocols are harder. And uh, this is like uh, hard squared. Um, the most popular option for now seems to be enshrining uh, things like MEV boost. Uh, there are other um, um, options. But uh, like the open problems here is how to deal with the reorgs. Right now, because of the reorgs, enshrining MEV is like pretty scary thing because it can be like uh, uh, rollback um, for money and that's like hot. Uh, that's why single slot finality uh, is probably a blocker for this. And uh, the other hard thing is censorship resistance uh, because if you get obligatory use of um, proposal auctions, then it means that like it's very hard to do censorship resistance based on um, uh, decentralization of uh, um, consensus layer. It doesn't matter how decentralized consensus layer because uh, censorship is wholly in the control of the uh, essential builders. So uh, the solution to like to this is probably inclusion list. So like the way for uh, consensus layer to actually um, include some transactions even if they don't fit into like the most expensive block or something. Um, uh, so, um, what's the impact um, and when it can be happen? Like, not soon. It's very hard problem to crack. Um, the impact is like if MEV rewards get burned, then rewards go down, uh, which is like pretty straightforward. Um, the upside, and that's very significant upside, is that's the streamlined uh, ethical and legal position or for stakers and. Uh, staking protocols and staking uh, staking products in general. Um, so it's basically instead of like coming after uh, builders and stakers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you can only come after Ethereum protocol, which is like pretty big and can fight back, right? So <coughs> uh, uh, this is like a very nice change to like risk calculation for participants and staking. Um, it would not require huge changes to LIDAR protocol, I think, because uh, uh, depending on the way it's implemented, of course, it's like very up in there. But uh, it's less thing to worry about. Uh, and uh, the um, probably hard part of work falls on like not operator management stuff. Uh, but like less work for MEV theft detection, which is like a thing right now. Um, enables more risk in uh, uh, staking modules. Like uh, actually decreases least in stake model uh, enables more risky like bonds and stuff, and um, uh, we will have to like think about uh, policies around inclusion lists and stuff. Um, next one is max effective balance bump, um, which uh, Mike uh, uh, was talking about on staking gathering like three days ago, right? Um, uh, it's a proposal that based on the fact that right now we can chain and pick on state and P2P network consume resources based on number of validators. Validator is a process that has like uh, uh, 32 other and the key to sign the messages. And there are much, much, much more validators than there are entities in the uh, stake in the consensus uh, layer, right? And uh, the actual need for resources is Per entity, it could be per entity instead of per validator. Um, so, what if uh, validator balance could be more than 32 ETH? Um, it's got like a small corner forms in it because, like, right now, uh, naive change of just like bumping up the max effective balance means that uh, it's uh, for not operators uh, to increase the max effective balance of like of the big uh, validator bu buckets means. Increasing risk without uh, uh, 
personal upside, like uh, entity upside. It's upside only for the network itself. Um, so changing those slashing mechanism can change uh, calculations here a bit. Um, the other problem is that like uh, if uh, not operators have to consolidate existing validators via exits and entries, that's also uh, losing rewards and that uh, party of withdrawals I think here and would need a separate change to protocol to implement. Um, I think this one is going to be soonish because like it's not controversial. Uh, it's uh, only difficulties it has are uh, like basically parameters change and like fairly straightforward changes that like you need to code but you don't need to think much about I think. Um, it would require some changes to LIDAR protocol uh, uh, but not much and uh, it's a potential for improve to improve network health like uh, Ethereum network health in exchange for extreme risks uh, like pretty slightly. Um, so it's like nothing groundbreaking on like side of ladder protocol, but new models are enabled like and need to be done. Uh, new kind of withdrawal credentials and uh, party of withdrawal have to be implemented. And uh, there will be huge changes to accounting oracles, to tooling, to data analytics. So like a lot of tooling will have to be uh, re-implemented or like upgraded. Uh, so a decent amount of work. Um, and on the not operate management side, it's mostly policies on consolidating, like also uh, some work, but like not uh, uh, groundbreaking. Um, withdraw and shaded exits. Uh, right now, uh, owner of validation key is the only one who can unstake. Like if you run a validator uh, uh, and withdraw credentials are not controlled by you, uh, the withdrawal, like the owner of the stake, the withdrawal validation credential controller is, uh, cannot say like, folks, please stop running the validator. Uh, well, exactly, that's what they can change. Like, please do it, please stop, stop stop staking, I want to stop staking. And the not operator can control, can like can say, no, I want, uh, I want to run this validator like for eternity. Um, uh, a measure of like taking as a hostage, right? Um, so uh, changing that would uh, like get more rights to withdraw uh, credential controllers, um, allow for less trustful delegation. Uh, it's really good for staking protocols, including liquid staking protocols, and uh, um, it's uh, like somewhat complex change that require message bus from execution layer to consensus layer, which of which we only have one right now. The uh, deposit queue and it's fairly complex to implement uh, on protocol level. Um, when not clear, uh, I think this, like there is a full-fledged EP for this, 7002, uh, but it's uh, like not championed, I think, right now. Um, uh, one way to move forward here is incorporated in uh, uh, MEB. Uh, max effective balance bump uh, because it's like one of the things that can be uh, done at the same time because like very similar things needs to be done in MEB uh, to uh, allow for a party of withdrawals. Um, in terms of impact on LIDO, that would allow to reduce risk of not operating misbehavior like a lot. Um, and protocol changes would be like I think on lowish side because like one thing that should be like done after that is an uh, upgrade that would allow uh, forceful uh, withdrawal and shaded exits after withdrawal oracles like proved to be ineffective. Like, uh, mm, and on the not operator management side, it would like decrease the risk of uh, uh, um, delegation to not operators and. Uh, allow for lower bond on, uh, for bonded model and community staking models. Uh, the one that is like most that gay I think right now after this uh, like uh, conference, that's like the first slides, uh, is uh, staking share uh, uh, soft limit. 
which is changing the curve of rewards for Ethereum uh, staking mechanism in a way uh, to target the uh, amount of stake, like pretty low, 15, 20% or so. Um, uh, that's what been uh, talked about in uh, uh, staking gathering talks and I think Islamic as well, uh, which I had to miss, so it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, so, if staking share is targeted to a low uh, percent of total ever, like 15, 20 percent or something like that, uh, what what uh, what can happen? Um, staking rewards after that uh, limit can go uh, to zero or to negative uh, amount. So, like you pay to stay actually. Um, it allows rough governance of Ethereum to tinker with staking mechanism more easily because stakers are a minority in, uh, between all holders and they don't have a lot, a lot of soft power to uh, basically uh, um, uh, uh, defend from changes they don't want to happen. And uh, uh, that means that like uh, other holders uh, as a like somewhat political force in, uh, rough governance can impose the changes on staking protocol um, that stakers don't want to uh, to happen. And uh, uh, um, basically it allows to change staking mechanism staking goes peer-shaped. Um, presumably there should be still enough security. Um, I'm not like based on talks I've seen and like I don't think that centralization and vertical integration vectors uh, are analyzed or enough or like maybe they're just being discarded. Like rewards going very low, which is probably would happen if targeting stake to like 15%, uh, will allow only the like the uh, largest node operators to operate at, at profit, which was push out the smaller operators, the uh, many solo stakers, uh, and would centralize the consensus layer very much. Um, uh, it's a pretty simple change of protocol, like not 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 super hard, so it can be implemented fairly quickly. Um, so when it happens, maybe not ever, might happen fast if there is consensus. Uh, there is like a sense of urgency for this uh, uh, in there, but uh, like impact on LIDAR could be very significant, depending on mechanism, on like realization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, not on protocol side because protocol side would like kind of probably remain the same. Uh, but if rewards go very low, then the budget Lido has for development and for not operators also goes slow, and that means uh, Lido cannot afford a, like a decentralized operator set. So basically, if like rewards uh, go into 0.1 percent, like right now, for example. Uh, 38 operators are probably a bit too much for us, right? Uh, we cannot afford to pay all them. And like right now we can afford to uh, like explore the uh, community stake and stuff like that. That's like uh, fits in the easiest budget. But like after that, um, if the rewards are low, like they don't. Um, and one, I think that's the last one, right, that I want to talk about, it's tired staking. Uh, um, the idea is to enshrine the de facto difference between not operators and delegators that exist in staking uh, layer. Like most stakers are not running the nodes themselves. Uh, it's very transparent in case of LIDO, for example, but it's actually the same for most of the stake that uh, exists in the network. Most of the stake is uh, run by um, not the same people who, who own the capital. Uh, like uh, Custodit uh, either is run by like exchanges of node operators, the um, uh, many funds and uh, uh, huge holders are using node operators to uh, stake as well. Um, so it would allow for a fully trustless rocket pool like system and like probably fully trust rocket pool as well uh, because the, like the idea is to have a bonded validator uh, that uh, uh, the, and the bond is like provided by the node operator and it's on the lowish side like four or something and the rest of uh, 
uh, effective balance of the validator is provided to the delegator who does not risk slash and co penalties. And they basically uh, just vote for not operators they want to see in the um, uh, on the consensus layer. Uh, it's a huge staking reduction on uh, a huge risk reduction on staking layer on like on con uh, for for stakers. Um, I still s don't get what positive change for Ethereum the whole it's supposed to bring. Like I, I don't understand. Like stakers will get reduced risk. What does it, Ethereum gets? Like I, I don't get it. Um, um, uh, if it happens, it won't happen soon because like it's fairly significant change, and it's not like all uh, that like developed. Um, if it happens, it brings a risk reduction uh, for Lido and for other uh, staking products and protocols. Uh, and easier time to build uh, bonded and community staking modules. Um, it would require some protocol changes because, like, you now have two tiers of stake, and like both has to be implemented in protocol. Um, and the risk evaluation for not operate management also like will will change. The risk will go down. Um, um, as you see, like most of the materials that uh, are cited here are like super recent. Um, uh, talks by uh, Ethereum uh, Foundation researchers on the staking gather and, and economics uh, conferences, and uh, there is like now a bit outdated uh, because like it's what made I think three weeks ago <laughs> uh, reading list that uh, Sasha has done on uh, debate on uh, staking that like uh, with sources going down, going back as far as like I think. Uh, 2020. Um, so thank you. Uh, that was all. Давай, Вас. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot to Vasily for uh, for an excellent presentation. Yeah, we're about to prepare the stage for a panel discussion. Um, but in the meantime, um, I think we can have like a short, short break. Um, please don't leave this room. Uh, we're just uh, waiting for the panelists to come in. It will take a few minutes. Okay, everyone, we are ready to start our panel. 
Um, the panelists uh, today are hopefully going to come on stage pretty soon. So um, we have uh, Marin from uh, Lido. Marin, I hope you're around. Otherwise, I'm going to feel embarrassed. So please appear out of thin air. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways, come on to the stage. I'll announce you once you come. <laughs> So uh, we have Marin from Lido, Justin from the Ethereum Foundation, Constantine from Cyberfund, and uh, Tarun from Gauntlet. Welcome, and let's get started. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last panel of the day. Uh, I mean, our panelists don't need a round of introduction, probably it's myself. So uh, I'm Marin, Master of Protocol Relations, contributing to Lido DAO. Uh, I'll be hosting this wonderful gentleman here, and we'll let them say a sentence or two before we dive into the panel. I'm Justin uh, from the Ethereum Foundation. I've been a researcher there for, for six years, and um, I have some opinions on, uh, on, on ETH as money and uh, looking forward to this panel. Yeah, my name is Konstantin Lomashuk. You know, like, uh, I was lucky to join Lido in day one. <laughs> yeah, and there are, I think this topic is really important, you know, like, in general for each person in this planet. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm happy to share my thoughts. Hey, uh, I'm Tarun, and I. I spend a lot of time writing papers about staking economics, and so I have, that's my lens on whether something is money or not. So to kick it off with, it's a no-brainer question. What makes better money, Ethereum or liquid staked asset based on Ethereum? <laughs> Feel free to hop in. Right, so I, I think we need to define what, what you mean by money. Um, and broadly speaking, I see two categories of money. One is money as currency. Um, so currency comes from the word current. It's money that flows, um, used as a medium of exchange. And then there's money you know, in the context of Ethereum, which is collateral money, which is money that's meant to be put in a black box and just stays there. Um, and there's this I guess two big flavors of usage of collateral money. One is for staking, uh, and the other one is, uh, is in, in DeFi, so kind of layer one versus layer two collateral money. Um, I, one of my, well, the, the, the ideal outcome, I think, for collateral money, which is the thing I, I'm most interested in, is that um, it simultaneously has yield or you know it's the, the the cost of holding the money is very very low um, and the the risk associated with it as a collateral is also very very low so the problem that we have today with the lsts as collateral money in, in DeFi, for example is that there's no guarantee that from one day to another the value will just go to zero Right? We can talk about contract risk, we can talk about governance risk, but even if those two were completely addressed uh, with technology by removing governance or with formal verification, fundamentally we still have operator risk and, and the associated slashing risk. Um, and so like the, my preferred path forward here is to somehow de-risk and remove the slashing aspect of it. And I, there's like three proposals uh, that I have in mind, but I, I don't wanna speak too much. Um, but happy to talk about these, these three proposals later. Darren, what would be your take? Uh, I think if we look at sort of the history of money, um, the move to kind of move off the gold standard uh, really relied on 
having bond-like assets, but then also having lending against bond-like assets, right? So if you compare you know, protocols to companies, most companies in the world store most of their assets in bonds because it's the only thing that the sovereign usually protects. It also is because there's just no one will give you insurance, right? And that's the closest you get to an insured holding entity. Um, and in some ways, a lot of capital finance, especially debt capital finance, really relied on this idea of the sovereign gave you bonds. You could borrow against the bonds if you needed cash. Uh, and that way you wouldn't have to be holding cash all the time. You don't think about custody risk. You don't think about all these other things. Uh, in a similar way, the custody risk aspect here is the operator risk, the slashing risk, the, the things of that nature. And the average protocol or consumer probably wants something that is like a bond, something that they have a repo market for. In some ways, ETH alone does have that, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually have the, the yield portion in a way that's convenient to actually make into a, a real repo market. So the repo market is, is you know, these, what I was talking about earlier, of like companies borrowing against their bond holdings, that's how they get cash instead of selling bonds. I generally think that the same kind of structure has partially shown up in LSTs. I mean, that's why you see all of their lending demand. That's why you see how, how they're used as collateral within DeFi. Uh, and in some ways, that to the average protocol that is holding ETH, to the average sort of user that's holding ETH, staked ETH is sort of more like what modern day 2023 money is versus pure medium of exchange gold standard era money. Constantine? Yeah, you know, like, I think this question is a little bit more complex, you know, like, because we're speaking about the future of money, yes? But uh, we should uh, look first on the current uh, situation. And in current situation, money is a paper, yes? Money is a Ponzi scheme. In general, it's the biggest, I think, Ponzi scheme ever. And uh, I mean, like, and why? First of all, you know, like, we should go a little bit back, you know, like, People want to use something real, like to like spend it, you know, like and to keep the value. But the user experience was so bad. If you speak about, you know, like coins or gold coins and so on, and that's where you know, like the government came to us and say, let's be, let's make like a better user experience, you know, like we will give you paper, uh, but guaranteed by the government. You know, like, but it was already three times. I mean, you can look on Ray Dalio or YouTube video, you know, like, it was already minimum three times when the government cheated, you know, like, and they changed and give us, they sold us that it's fully baked by gold paper. Yes, it's great. It's, uh, but uh, then they, like, said one day that, oh, guys, <laughs> we have too much spending, you know, like, it's not efficient and let's forget about the gold and let's keep just spent our paper. <laughs> You know, like, and this is the current state where we are, you know, like, and it will collapse one day. And now when we think about the money, we should think about what people want. But people don't need money at all. Let's disrupt the world money, you know, like. People will first uh, want to keep some assets that has value, real value. And now when, you know, like this Ponzi collapse, it's a big chance that it will be another Ponzi called Bitcoin. <laughs> It's maybe not popular, like, uh, solution here, but what I can try to say is that, you know, like, what people want, for example, when I, like, started in 2014 in the crypto space, you know, like, or try to get what is the money, you know, like, and how, and one of the main, like, uh, thing was is liquidity, and I read, like, one nice book where people say, oh, S&P 500 is better money than, like, USD dollar Y, because it's baked by top companies, you know, like. But the issue is that you don't have a good user experience to spend this S&P 500, you know, like ETFs, you know, like, and that's why, you know, like, uh, yeah, so like we still use do dollars. And when we go into Bitcoin, you know, like the question of Bitcoin, that what they did is, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, of course, they create this ecosystem, yes, and unique technology called blockchain. But, you know, like the real value inside the micro economy, you know, like they don't have it. You know, like it is only external value. In general, it's meme coin. What is the difference between dog coin and Bitcoin? You know, like I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, Bitcoin is the first currency, you know, like uh, maybe. Uh, and the question is when we try to speak about future money, 
we can't sell the same narrative again, you know, like with a new currency. Of course, you, I mean, the difference between dollars and bitcoins because you don't have uh, like treasury who can create a new coins. It is a protocol inside. Yes, this is a big difference. But when we look on Ethereum, Ethereum has real value. It has real microeconomy, real companies, decentralized organization that pay fees, and you can understand that it's real value. And my answer here is not about even literally staking or staking. Of course, we'll discuss it in all the next questions, you know, like, but my answer here is that people want to hold value first and then spend it with a good UX, with intense or like some other just like so pay for their bill, doesn't matter in what currency it is and what, and with new technologies with current user experience, it will happen where you, doesn't matter what you believe, like in Polygon, Lyra, like Ethereum, and other, anything can be money. And we need to destroy one money because it's create a lot of additional value that is not baked by value, you know, like, and I think this is a big, a big, a lot, a big issue. But uh, in general, ability uh, to pay goods and services is what's important to so-called next wave of users. So how would the uh, Ethereum, Justin, I guess this one is for you because uh, you did mention your fears about slashing and that it could influence uh, the value. How, how does it cope with volatility? What are the attributes that you would put as ETH is the better solution in this case? Right, so as you said, for most people, when you say money, they think currency, right? It's mm -hmm. things that they can buy goods and services with. And um, the, the, the reality is that ETH is just terrible money, if that's your definition of money. Um, and instead, what you want to do is kind of take out a loan. You want to get cash from, from, your, from your collateral ETH and maybe reminiscent to the, to the, to the bond market, right? Like, ETH is the, the bond, I guess, and then if you're taking out a stable coin, it's kind of like the loan that, that, that's backed by the, by the bond. Um, now, what I think we sh should see in the, in the long term is like very scalable, decentralized uh, stable coins. And there's, 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 there's several like, you know, really good reasons for that. Um, the, the, basically, the, the centralized stable coins are you know, just just problematic and and like one one of them for example is I I don't see the centralized stable coins um, just growing to you know tens of trillions of dollars or even like to a trillion dollars deal we've had USDT that scaled to 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 a hundred billion but can it grow a, another order of magnitude it's kind of unclear to me um, and then there's also this aspects of of neutrality and and composability like if you if you're building an application uh, which is fully immutable and is meant to last decades and centuries, is, last to last, is meant to last as long as Ethereum itself, then you can't really use USDT as a, as a primitive because USDT always has the option to, to, to rug you. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to have these really scalable uh, decentralized stable coins. And I think there's, there's multiple things that we need to solve to get there. One is the decentralized oracle, which we haven't solved yet. That's one component. But another like, key component is reducing the so-called cost of money. Because right now, we have things like, like Maker and Liquity, where you deposit your ETH, but the cost of just holding raw ETH is extremely high. It's basically the, the same as the, 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 the staking yield. And so in order to bring the cost of money down, you want to be holding this yield-bearing kind of bond-like asset as opposed to the, to the, to the raw asset. Um, but you want to do so in a safe way. Um, and by safe, um, it, I really mean removing all the risks. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that Lido will remove contract risk. I'm also you know, relatively confident that it will remove governance risk, but we're still left with this uh, operator risk. And so I kind of see these three solutions to, 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 uh, to removing this, this operator risk. Like one way to do it is basically the suggestion by Dankrat and you know, later revisited by Vitalik, which is very, very simply just cap the, uh, the, um, the, pos the possible uh, penalties for any given validator. So you have a, a validator that's 32 ETH, let's say at most one eighth, so at most 
uh, for ETH can be, can be slashed or can be leaked if you go offline. And the 28 ETH, the, the rest is just um, you know, untouchable, at least on-chain. Um, and so now you're in a position where you can create this yield-bearing asset for, um, and, 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 and a, an LST uh, which doesn't have the, the corresponding slashing risk. Another uh, possible solution, kind of in a similar vein, is to cap the amount of stake teeth, right? Because if we cap it to one eighth, uh, then you know seven eighth is 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 not staked. Um, and what will happen economically if you cap it at, at one eighth is that the um, the the issuance actually starts going to zero and most likely even negative to compensate for for things like MEV and and, and restaking. And so you're in a position where you've kind of lowered the cost of money because you, you, you have this extremely competitive market where the, the issuance goes, goes negative. And you've kind of solved the solution because you know, the vast majority of all ETH that's circulating is kind of this very cheap to hold uh, raw ETH. Um, and then the third solution that I see potentially, but that's a very, very long-term one, is using this amazing cryptography called one-shot signatures. So the, very, very briefly, a one-shot signature scheme is a, a signature scheme where the private key uh, can only sign a single message and then it destroys itself. So it can't sign two, two messages. And the, the way that it works is that the private key is a, a quantum object, a, a quantum superpo superposition, and the act of signing requires you to observe this superposition, therefore collapsing it and destroying it so that you can't sign a second message. And then once you have these one-shot signatures, you can build these unidirectional chains that can't, chains of signatures that can't fork, and you can solve the double voting problem, and you can solve the surround vote problem. That, um, so basically, you can remove the slashing conditions uh, of Ethereum layer one, and you can start building LSTs uh, that don't have this, this slashing operator risk. You're only left with the leaking risk. But the really nice thing about leakage is that it's a slow process, right? You go offline and you, you're just leaking just tiny amounts. And so if you allow for forced exits that are kind of much faster than, than the leaking process, then um, you actually have this you know, very secure LST um, that simultaneously is yield-bearing and is uh, you know, suitable to be used as, as collateral money for a decentralized stable coin that is on the order of tens of trillions of dollars. Constantine. Uh, yeah. Can I ask Justin here, because he said like three uh, like, uh, cases, you know, like one is uh, 20 years away, this is the third one, yes? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just to clarify for everyone. Uh, and there, I mean, the second one, you said like, if you change taking ratio, you know, like, to one eighth of ease, what you try to solve by it? You said you try to solve, you know, like the slash increase for LST and the like, what is the solution here? Yeah, exactly. So we want to try and find uh, a way to have this low cost of money asset, uh, which is very good collateral and doesn't have the, the, the slashing risk. And so um, if, you, if you have this, this, this hard cap at one eighth of the stake ETH, then just purely in terms of like supply, right? Like the majority, seven eighth, is going to be uh, you know, unslashable just by construction because it's not staking. Um, and then um, if, if you take the other approach, uh, which is um, kind of you, you, you allow for 100% of the, the, the ETH to be staked, but only one eighth of it is going to be slashable, um, then you, you're, you're kind of allowing for a trustless rocket pool style designs. So right now, rocket pool our ETH is also kind of terrible collateral money. You know, almost basically just as bad as ST ETH is as, 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 as collateral money. Uh, and the reason is that both of them can go to zero from one day to the next. Uh, but once you have this, um, this cap on the amount of of, uh, of slashing, then at least for the portion which is not slashable, which is the vast majority, the seven eighth, um, you can have this perfect like World War III grade collateral um, op on which you can build this really scalable um, decentralized stablecoin. 
So your position is that like uh, native like uh, uh, liquid staking is a good solution, and uh, like liquid staking by other protocols is not, as I get it. No, 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 no. So <laughs> I mean, like, with, because it is a risk of, uh, yeah, I mean, like, if you can stake only one age, you know, for ETH and all other is, uh, like, uh, get you yield and also liquid. Yeah, I mean, the way that I think about it is just, it's, it, it's a programmable building block uh, that can be used to build, you know, application layer LSTs, and they're going to be a whole ecosystem of them. And, and, and you know, the beauty of Ethereum is that it's this open programmable thing. It wouldn't be enshrining a specific, you know, LST. It's just giving you the option to build something really solid. Because right now, you know, admittedly, the way that things are designed, it's impossible to build a good collateral asset which is cheap and secure. Um, so in that sense, we we kind of messed up, right, as uh, designers of of the layer one and. Turns out there's a very, very there's two very, very easy fixes. Easy fix number one is you change the issuance curve to go negative around uh, around the cap. That's that's almost a one line change. Um, and then option number two is you 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 cap the amount of of penalties per validator, and you know that's maybe you know. 50 line changes. Yeah, yeah, but the first is destroying the staking market, you know, like if it will be zero rate, you know, like uh, staked. All the like professional validators that are here, solo validators that are here will just quit and will just get coin base with 20% stake. But it's easy to implement, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd say one is more aggressive than the other. Like the negative, the capping with the negative issuance is, is much more aggressive and opinionated. So you know, I would lean a little bit more on the capping the penalties, um, which, you know, the only thing it does is that it makes Lido and Rocket Pool just better products. Uh, Taryn, what would be your take from the risk assessment perspective? Yeah, so I think uh, I, I'm more of the mindset that actually slashing is very hard to remove um, because I think, you know, there's the, the model of sort of the honest but curious bad validator who happens to double sign because like their network card had some issues or they happen to um, equivocate on a vote. But then there's the adversarial kind of thing and we saw this with the malicious proposer in April 2023 where a proposer, I mean due to a malfunction of a relay, the proposer was able to see the contents of a block and then produce a second block uh, that front run all the transactions of the previous one. And that type of behavior is effectively always needs to be A, attributable, but B, sort of attributable and slashable. And I, I think even in a world where we have basically everything, um, you know, cryptographically that we could possibly imagine, I still think there's this problem of the application layer leaking into the, the, the main layer. And there's that is not going to be removed. And because of that, you're always going to have a slash. So one-shot signatures do solve this problem. <laughs> I, I don't see how you, you solve the MEV part of this. Yeah, you do. Because the way, the way that the rugging worked was that there was double signing at a single slot. With one-shot signatures, you can only sign a single message at, so, at, so, at one slot. So, so I, I get that the slot signature happens that way. But if I think about the auction, for who's actually running the block builder, like that part of the market now will, will, will potentially have more misbehavior, right? Between the proposer and the builders in terms of collusion. Like it, it's, not, it's not clear that you've completely elided that just from, from the single signature. And, and that's what I'm saying. There's another facet about slashing that's worth considering, which is if we consider Ethereum staking right now, it's horrendously over collateralized, at least on a historical basis, relative to the amounts of slashing, right? In the sense that, for the most part, most slashing penalties are probably too small. But sometimes they actually need to be much larger. And so there's also another sense in which if slashing penalties were more dynamic or responsive, and that's you know something I think that is, is sort of an in-between of like, hey, we're just going to hard cap them versus, hey, depending on sort of the frequency of slashing and sort of when certain events come, then we kind of have sort of a adjusted slashing, like a controller for slashing. That sort of at least will allow you to have the flexibility to to deal with some of these kind of proposer and 
supply chain collusion type of things. For Constantine, uh, with implementation of DBT, do you find we avoid going into this rabbit hole of uh, changing the emission curve, uh, having to cap amount of being slashed because it obviously affects not only economy but security and centralization. So what would be the models in your opinion to avoid this kind of a uh, direction? Uh, you know, my opinion here, first of all, you know, like uh, why we, you know, like start Ethereum that we hope that it was, it is impossible to build a safe application on top of it, you know, like, and I think that to light is, right, or like any other liquid staking solutions, it's a pretty simple application uh, compared to what we are planning to build, you know, like I hope that we can dam our brains somewhere uh, one day, you know, like on chain, you know, like, and, uh, and it will be much more complex application and this infrastructure should work, you know, like, and uh, for me, you know, like when we speak about DVT, you know, like the cost of DVT is high and we see how it is about three, four solutions now is competing on DVT market. They invest in their capital because one day I think they want to make revenue, but at the same time, they also want to make Ethereum more secure, you know, like, and it's uh, like ever some teams, you know, like who uh, really like uh, do a lot of, uh, I mean, really complex things, you know, like to make it work. And, but the cost of running over the data will grow. The security will be uh, much higher. Why? Because, you know, like, uh, it's well, the slash increase will like like double down many times, uh, but still, you know, like for me, uh, about back to the question of uh, like minimal viable inf inflation or emission, I think it's more right to answer like uh, definition of that. Uh, I am really like seeing that uh, this is a budget for the, for security. If the budget will be zero, like your network will be ten times low decentralized and security. Uh, and secure, you know, like, and if it is the main value of Ethereum, you know, like, this is just a disruption. I mean, the, the, the negative issuance part only comes in once you have reached your security goal. Um, and if you're, if you have significantly less than then you do have, you know, large security budget. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, if it, I mean, it depends on the parameters of staking ratio, you know, like, and if staking ratio is 20%, for me, you know, like, it's uh, giving the market to, like, uh, centralized parties who has all this ease, who has low cost to run, and also, like, if it will be, like, 50, 60, I don't know, like, what is the number, right number here. We need to, to make a lot of research. But what I try to say is that it is a market. It's a lot of infrastructure provider, pro providers. They are great people. They invest in capital they bring in a lot of value and uh, this decision of changing MVI is really, uh, I, I think why, why also we are talking about that right now? Because I think that the definition of the money, because it's want to be money, you know, like I think this is Collateral why. Collateral money. I, I, some type of money, you know, like everybody has different uh, feeling about that, yes. <laughs> and, I, and also like a uh, unit of account, you know, like, and uh, the question is, uh, I mean, it should be secure and decentralized, you know, like, and if you will cut MVI, you know, like, it will harm it, in my point of view, depends on the staking criteria, you know, like, and that's why it's important. I, I think very few collateral monies that have survived over many years and have had high amounts of liquidity have had very unpredictable inflation curves. Uh, the moment you have this, like, high amount of volatility in inflation curves, you've seen a lot of historical empires collapse or, or countries that have failed. Uh, and I think, I think, you know, the thing that Bitcoin gets right is that it doesn't really change its emissions. It, you know, now there's obviously sustainability issues with this, but this idea of having such drastic changes to emissions is actually going to cause a lot of lo loss of confidence in the market, especially liquidity-wise. And, and historically, we've seen that happen in, in so many currencies. I mean, think about the country we're in right now. They've had, they've had tons of emission changes, effectively, that have, like, are the reason you see USDT on Tron everywhere when you walk around Istanbul. So I agree with that statement, but only if the, the radical change to the issuance is in the bad direction, right? where there's like more issuance. But historically with Ethereum, and I think there's this social understanding that you know, we like progress and we like to improve things in the good direction. And we went from five ETH per block to three ETH per block to two ETH per block to what we have now, which is on the order of, I don't know, maybe half an ETH per block, something like that. Um, and then, you know, with, with, with capping, you know, it's even lowering the reassurance. And then there's even another technology, which is MEV burn, which even like 
you know, reduces the, 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 the net supply growth and net issuance. And then we have EIP 1559, which also goes in the right direction. So, so long as there's this understanding around kind of maximum viable scarcity or minimum viable issuance, um, then, uh, then I'm not too worried about this loss of confidence. So from the value perspective, how do you take changing the issuance affects the narrative of uh, Ethereum being go to institutional chain? <clears throat> Sorry, are you saying that the, f the fact that the monetary policy changes is... Not specifically from the monetary policies, but what's important for institutional side is to rely on uh, long-term emissions, right? to be able to calculate the risks. So once you put yourself in a position where you can plug it in or plug it off, uh, it really becomes a more of an unsafe environment. Right. Um, so basically, there's the the V in MVI is the maybe one of the most important words. It's viable, and viable means that the chain is secure. And what what Bitcoin got wrong is that they forgot about the the, the V. <laughs> they just went for the M, which is minimal issuance, uh, specifically zero issuance in in, in the end game. Um, and I think. Um, from you know, from the perspective of an institution looking at the risk of, of Ethereum, there's, there's basically two risks. One is that we forget about the V and we start compromising on security, and I, and I think there's there's just no way that we we do that. Um, I mean, historically we've never compromised on security. Uh, we've always overpaid for security, uh, you know, by a very large margin. And even today, I think we're overpaying for security. Um, and then, you know, there's the M aspect, uh, which we've never forgotten since Genesis. As I said, we've, ke we've kept on improving the M, we, you know, just constantly reducing issuance and increasing the burn. And, you know, there's a few more opportunities to improve on the M. One is MEV burn and one is state capping. Um, may maybe we'll do these things, maybe we won't. Uh, but in, in any case, it's going in the right direction. It's It's... If an institution is worried about being diluted over the long term, well, you know, they can, they can look at the worst case, which is the status quo, and the future can only improve over the status quo. Taron, in terms of risks, obviously, adding additional layer of smart contracts, everyone knows, increases the risks, but we mentioned it's good to have EAT as a collateral money. We mentioned LST as a collateral money. Uh, what are the risks if we use them both as a collateral for the new coming LST Phi? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first off, you confuse the users as we as we learned during uh, DeFi summer when there was 500 USD T X dot Y combos for every X and Y under three character letters, um, uh, and I think the other part is, yeah, fragmenting liquidity between them will oftentimes have sort of bad things happen, especially if there's sort of a, a large market correction or more market unwind. For instance, last year when Three Arrows sort of started selling their stick teeth. Um, but I think one important thing to consider from the perspective of a long-term ETH holder is, you know, I don't think people are strictly looking at the reward. I think there is still some sort of mean variance type of thing that people care about. And one thing that LSTs give you and one thing that mining pools give you in, in proof of work is lower variance in your rewards. And I think fundamentally for a lot of people that is part of their objective, right? They want to earn X percent in ETH or they want to own this percentage of the network, but they also don't want that much volatility on that income. And the less volatility you have on the income, the better it is as collateral, right? Because you have an income stream, which is reliable, that you are using as collateral. And I think one of the beauties of staking versus, say, proof of work chains, in theory, is that if you actually really got the, the pooling mechanism to work correctly, you can really borrow against your future rewards almost risk-free. And like the long-term goal of all of this should be that, right? It's, it's you're able to borrow against future income streams um, the same way you might borrow with a mortgage, Right where you're borrowing against your future 
income from your job that has very high volatility to, hey, I can borrow against a future income stream. It has basically no volatility, no variance, and like everyone can trust it, right? That's when you're absolutely the best. And I think there's this kind of thing that the pooling mechanisms do lower that variance, right? They, they do lower that volatility and make it easier to underwrite. Now, of course, there's these other risks, so you have to balance those, those two. But I, I think that's sort of one of the reasons it's hard for me to imagine you know, a hedge fund uh, in a, you know, somewhere where you know, they're, you know, they're like, hey, we want to have 20% of our fund in ETH, being like, we're going to actually run our own staking operation. Right? They, 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 a, they have the fixed cost. B, they're not getting the volatility reduction from pooling with other people. And you know, I think the question of how much that outweighs the smart contract risk is something the market has de determined with the amount of liquidity it's provided. One of the things that's going to improve the variance situation is MEV burn, because right now we're in a position where you enter a bull market, MEV goes to the moon, and now you know, the, you're making 5, 6, I know, 10 percent, uh, and then this is arbitraged really, really slowly because the, the activation queue has this churn uh, limit which, uh, which prevents the arbitrage from happening instantly. Uh, and then vice versa on the on the bear market, you know, you might only make two percent APR because there's just no MEV. Um, so if we want to, you know, solve this volatility issue, this variance issue, then MEV burn is a, a big a big component. So, so I would I would say I think it could be a an important component. But one thing, if we look at the history of Ethereum from uh, the history of MEV in Ethereum, you know, 2016 we had PGAs and basically tons of flooding of mempools, ton, tons of spam in the public mempool. Then we have Flashbot's centralized auction, but it's a centralized combinatorial auction, so you have to handle people sending a bundle that is three transactions, a sandwich attack, or people sending a bundle that is the whole block, FOMO 3D, like I want to prevent everyone else from trying to, to be last in the contract. Uh, and so your, your space of possible things is quite large, so you have to have a centralized auction. It's very basically impossible to run that in a PBS-style system. Then we got to an aggregated auction, right, uh, where we have a single, there's only a single object that's really being auctioned, the entire block. And this entire sequence of events is I'm aggregating order flow, aggregating order flow, aggregating order flow. And a lot of this is to increase MEV as much as possible because it allows proposers, validators, to earn a ton of income that's not subsidized, right? It, it's, it's extra income that's not subsidized. The problem is we're now in the, the disaggregation phase of Ethereum, right? The reason people are talking about intents, the reason people are talking about RFQs, the reason people are talking about, uh, you know, decentralized sequencer type of things is people are trying to, to make sure there's less of that money coming in. So I, I'm actually not convinced, you know, we had this aggregation phase of Ethereum, but if the disaggregation phase becomes really popular, then I'm not sure it will reduce that much volatility. Right. I think what you're trying to say is that MEV will tend to zero because um, users and various actors will get more sophisticated. I agree. Like users, either with encrypted mempools or with things like MEV share, won't be leaking the MEV to the to the stakers, to the to the validators, the proposers. Um, same thing with the liquidity providers. There's better Dex designs that are coming where LPs won't be sitting ducks just waiting to be hit by, by toxic flow. Um, and I think what will also happen is that uh, wallets will be, will, will be smarter as well. Like right now, they're just letting their users uh, you know, get, get picked on um, and, uh, and you know, maybe they will want a share of it. And so I guess what you're saying is that um, the MEV that's currently being given to the, to the stakers is going to be like unbundled and taken yes. apart by all these different actors and what's going to be left uh, for the stakers is merely the tips, like the inclusion tips, which are like really, really minimal. Uh, and in which case, MEV burn has no impact because there's basically nothing to burn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm saying I'm not sure how much disaggregation we'll have, but if you look at the things that people are doing right now, it's all about disaggregating. Shall we make some sort of a prediction on like <laughs> the ratio I'm between bad, bad. <laughs> congestion fees and contention fees, which is basically MEV? Like, m my new thesis is that uh, con contention fees, basically MEV, will be less than 5%, uh, you know, within 18 months relative to, to congestion. So just to give you a um, frame of reference, 
Nowadays, it's 85, 15%. 18 months is a little fast for that big of a decrease. Um, <laughs> but I do agree with you trend-wise. I think, it, I think you, you, you go down to the sub 10% within five years. I, I'm, I'm not willing to be as aggressive as that. <laughs> what about you, Constantine? Well, you know, like, uh, I think I agree with Justin here. Playing it safe. Uh, so to slightly wrap it up, with all this in mind, open question for all of you. In ideal state, with all the problems solved, what would you say it will be better money? EAT or LST? All the problems solved. Right. Um, I mean, there is a possible outcome where if is the LST, right? Um, like, <laughs> the reason being, like, the, the yield is zero. Uh, on the LST and the basically equivalent uh, items. Or, oh, I mean, another way to see it is the, the whole trustless rocket pool, right? Like, the 28 are if when you have the cap on, on, the, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the, the penalty is basically like if it has the, 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 same, the same properties. Um, and, like, the same thing with the... The sa same thing with the... <clears throat> with the one-shot signatures. Like, with one-shot signatures, you could potentially foresee a world where effectively 100% of all the ETH is, is staking and, like, they're, they're, they're very, very similar assets. Um, I think the reason why there's such a big gap today between the, the, the staked ETH and the ETH, like, the reason why the cost of money delta is so high is... Um, it's just because the fundamentals are, you know, not very good on the staking level. But if we continuously improve the staking level, reduce the risk, then we're just shrinking the delta. And eventually, it's possible the delta is so small that they're effectively the same thing. Constantine? Yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. You know, like, I agree, you know, like, if it will be the risk is lower and lower and lower, of course, we can, like, or try to minimize the APR for this risk, you know, like, to the capital. But uh, for now, you know, like, and, uh, I think that uh, we can't make, like, uh, this upgrade so fast, you know, like, like you said, this uh, one-time signature 20 years, you know, like, we hope it will be faster, maybe, like, with acceler uh, accelerationism, you know, like, we can get it, like, in five years. Uh, but until now, we also have, like, uh, some uh, amount of features that we want to see in Ethereum, you know, like, and it's all, I mean, part of them, like, to make staking better, part of them to make liquid staking better, triggerable withdrawals, it's like, so the features that we need to deliver as soon as we can to make more uh, competitions there. But when we will make our liquid staking safe, and I hope that we can make, like, fully tr trustless, fully safe, application, you know, like on top of Ethereum, that is possible. I, I believe that's possible, yes. <laughs> and then, you know, like I don't know why uh, people will not stake, you know, like it will be like a reason for it, you know, like maybe it will be other way of trading, you know, like paying fees and so, but, uh, uh, you know, like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding a lot of ease, I'm staking a lot of ease, staking with liquid staking, you know, like, and uh, I s want to spend it too as money, you know, like, and I really believe when people will get, when we will get, see it in TikTok, you know, like, uh, description why uh, ultrasound money is cool, well, why stake this is cool, you know, like, I mean, it will, will be a new flipping, you know, like, and, uh, and maybe not only with Bitcoin, and it will be interesting, it will be exciting, it will be, you know, like, dangerous, but uh, it's in inevitable. So I'm going to maybe have a cop-out answer, but again, go back to the, the lores of financial history to, to kind of give some context. So if we look at the, the U.S. Uh, treasury market, you know, especially post-gold standard, the number one thing that was interesting about moving off the gold standard was that you saw this dramatic increase in issuance in corporate bonds. Um, you know, I think prior to... Uh, the gold treasuries being able to be borrowed against very easily, underwriting corporate bonds was quite hard for a lot of people, and so people would would mainly do either equity or you know more direct loans versus these kind of bond-like structures. But once 
the repo market became liquid. It was a lot easier to do corporate bonds, and you, that, you know that's sort of why you had the barbarians of the gate, 1980s P stuff, right? 1970, you have 10 years to get a bunch of liquidity into treasuries, and once the treasury liquidity was sufficient, people were willing to underwrite corporate bonds. We're about to have that in Ethereum, which is restaking, because you're effectively, I, the restaking market is effectively a corporate bond market, right? It's the roll-ups are corporations, who are borrowing from the main chain. They're borrowing again, you know, from holders of the treasuries. And I think that the restaking market will choose the winner because the amount of liquidity you see in the restaking market that comes from particular types of LSTs versus potentially Ethereum directly, I think will will show you whether, you know, which is preferred by by the companies, the roll-ups, as a form of money. And that's to me, that's like the market's decision of this. So I didn't give you an answer, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you what I think is the way you should measure the answer. Interesting take, and because it's such an interesting topic, I want to kind of uh, get a glimpse. Do you want to add to it? Because a risk taking does change the game a bit. So I, I do like um, the, the analogy, but wouldn't the analogy be that it's the risk taking application that's the corporation that's lending. Uh, why, 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 why roll ups? Oh, sorry, sorry. When I say roll up, I'm restaking application. I'm thinking of like a decentralized sequencer who's ah, forced. Okay. Sorry, I've, <laughs> I, I added one extra layer Step. to that. But. Okay, right. Yeah, uh, that 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 makes sense. Um, I mean, one thought that is kind of very primitive. I need to think about it more. But um, like, if we want to prevent kind of restaking from shaping staking. Um, maybe that's an argument, very much an argument against minimum viable issuance. Like if we have like, we're just overpaying for security, um, then, you know, there's like a, a big fat 5% APR, uh, then it's much harder to get bullied by a, a, a restaking application because, you know, you know if, if they provide, let's say 1%, then 1% is a small compared to the 5%. Whereas if we go like full on MVI, uh, and we only have, let's say, half a percent of, of, of staking yield, then, then you can kind of get bullied by, uh, by the, the restaking applications. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with, like, uh, Justin here. I think that restaking, if we, I mean, I, I, I think that we need to overpay, especially in the beginning, you know, like, I mean, we can cut always, <laughs> and but if we will cut and destroy the value, you know, like, it will be like a big disruption. And there, in case of restaking, are, you know, like, are, first of all, it is already risk taking exists, you know, like, and people use it everywhere. It's called leverage taking, you know, like, so when you get staked is, then go into our and do leverage taking, so land is and staked it again, you get, and it's delta natural strategy. Only the slash increase is coming if staked is price is going down to ease, you know, like, and it's, we can call it as a risk taking, you know, like, and people are using it right now. And it's, uh, I mean, the yields are, you know, like, and we can look what is their market share and what collaterals they choose already. <laughs> and it is already an answer then if we speak about uh, what they choose. But I think that uh, when you speak about corporation, you know, like, first of all, I disagree with you that it will be a lot of corporation, I mean, all like DAOs on top of Ethereum. It's not only roll up and infrastructure, it will be a lot of them. Some of them will have also will have bonds. And the second, you know, like when we speak about restaking, we should don't forget that it's not only only is can be restaked. Any asset can be restaked. I think it's like misleading a little bit by like positioning of restaking. All assets that based in Ethereum, it's USDC, USDT, LP token, and Uniswap can be restaked. And what we need here is like our open market, you know, like where any. And I even created like stupid uh, restaking protocol. I can uh, tell it now where, you know, like it is a smart contract. It is AWS, you know, like it choose any RC20 token, you know, like to restake. Then it choose any validator. And then you can use a slashing, you know, like way how you this network slash. And it works, you know, like, I mean, but or, I mean, it can be Ethereum. And why not to use Ethereum? Maybe it will be the most liquid, not so volatile. And that's why restaking market will choose to take Ethereum, Ethereum as the number one asset. But also, I mean, when you are AWS, you want to buy liquidity for the most cheapest price, 
you know, like, and people don't think about that because they call well, this cool, you know, like, let's just take this. But how much you will pay for it? It's like, well, you're buying insurance, you know, like, you want to pay a low amount. I mean, if you ever bought insurance, you should understand it, you know, like, and this is, here is this two economy, you know, like, we should look at numbers, think deeper, you know, like, and build best infrastructure on Ethereum. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasant conversation. I hope everyone enjoyed it here. Uh, they are really big brains on the subject, so catch them before they run out. All right. Thanks again for a great panel. Next, uh, we have an, a, a small change to the program. Uh, we have a presentation by Dmitry uh, from Lido, who's going to talk about uh, solo staking. So um, let's welcome Dmitry. I already see him somewhere in the in the back. Okay, okay. Uh, so let me start right now. I was given a chance, like literally 10 minutes, to present CSM. Uh, can I have switch? Yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, this one. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about community staking module, a module with a key feature that you will know about a bit later. Uh, yeah. My name is Dmitry. I'm a Lido contributor. I work on community staking direction. Let's try to first understand why do even solo staking interesting for Lido? I mean, there's no problems with operators, with validators, with capacity, everything's do going well. Why to think about solo staking? The answer is simple and it lies in Lido mission to make staking simple, secure, and decentralized. And by far, solo staking is the best way to make staking secure and decentralized. Let's do a quick recap of the things that you currently need to do solo staking. First of all, you need a lot of capital, namely 32 ETH. Then you need hardware, you need to cover operational costs, you need significant DevOps skills, and something is going wrong with the mic. Can we replace it? Uh, yeah, it's fine? Okay. For some reason, I hear myself that. And the last but not the least, you need luck to get juicy MEV because you propose blocks not frequently. And uh, it will be such an unfortunate situation if you will miss this huge MEV that will go to, let's say, Lido. So overall, it looks pretty complicated. Let's make solo staking simple. The main goal of Lido Community Staking Initiative is indeed to make solo staking simple and more accessible for solo stakers. But how do we make it simple? And now you think that we are here at Lido event and protocols like Lido, they just make huge unilateral decisions and never ask anyone about how to better do it. Let's find out why it is not the case for Lido. To understand it, let's take a look at process of decision making, of typical decision making for any changes in Lido on Ethereum protocol. The first comes the proposal. Once the proposal is prepared, either by Lido contributors or by anyone else in the community, it is revealed to public. And then comments, opinions are collected and the proposal is refined. And the process goes on and on until there is an agreement between authors of the proposal, between LDO holders, and for sure between community. And only when these three parties are more or less aligned, we can go to implementation. Now, it's time to reveal the proposal. Introducing you guys community staking module, a module for community stakers made by community stakers and staking fans, with the key feature, with no doubts, being permissionless entry to LIDA validator set. The term community stakers was invented, not invented, but introduced by many organizations within or parties within DeFi and also by LIDO contributors 
and it stands for independent groups running val groups or individuals running validators being aligned with ethereum and with the main motivation being not financial that's crucial to understand because if you have financial motivation then you end up as a professional operator and that's the different case to achieve this goal this ambitious goal of making solo staking easy, it is proposed to focus on these three key values. First of all, reduce barriers to entry. At the moment, we all know it's not that easy to enter solo staking because capital requirements, skills requirement, and hardware requirement is pretty significant. The second one is to improve Ethereum resilience because the more independent actors, the more solo stakers, community stakers are in Ethereum, the more resilient it is. And the last but not the least is to make validation more profitable. Even though the main motivation of community stakers as we see them at the moment is not financial, at the end of the day we all need to pay bills. So let's dive deeper. We will do a super quick walk through the design features first and for sure we start with permissionless entry. With community staking module, LIDA validator set will finally become permissionless. Anyone, I mean anyone sitting here or in all of all planet will be able to become validator and validate with Lido. We do think that it that makes no sense to invent a bicycle when there is already a bicycle, when there is already a bunch of bicycles. That's why instead of creating yet another tool for validator preparation, we think that it makes sense to set up integrations with the well-known solutions so that all of them or most of them will be integrated with LIDO and you can just set your validator in three clicks using your preferred solution, hardware or software, no matter, and then join LIDO. Nonlinear bonding feature is one of the things that has been discussed for a while, yet uh, at the moment there, we do think that Nonlinear bonding will help reduce barriers even lower. Given the fact that the bond will be associated with the not operator, not validator, we find it possible to reduce bond for the second and further validators so that the barriers will be even lower. Since bond will be required to create validators, it is the most, the fairest one option to allocate stake in the same order the bond is applauded. And the, one of the most crucial features that I find in CSM is Performance Oracle. By default, in Lido, rewards are distributed between validators, proportion between not operators, proportional to number of validators, no matter what performance is, because there are other levers to influence validators' performance. In the permissionless way, it is not so. We cannot influence any of them. Lido cannot, Lido contributors cannot, no one can. But who can is Performance Oracle. And it is proposed to use performance thresholds, so those community stakers who are above the performance threshold within a frame will get socialized rewards, and those who are below will not get rewards at all. It makes sense to do so because we understand that for community stakers, there's no chance that there will be five nines in performance, and it will most likely be less of them. So you shouldn't care about small power outages or internet outages you should you can just operate and make sure be sure that your rewards will be even and now let's do a super quick walk through the cool features because team is telling me that i'm running out of time so low bond yeah the bond should be low and we will try to do it as low as possible given the latest researches the latest updates in ethereum ecosystem and the latest risk analysis Simple UX, you guys all use your smartphones and you like, most likely like, how simple the UX it is. So let's make solo staking UX simple. You just prepare your validation setup, you just upload your validator keys and bond within one transaction and then the only thing you need to do is validate and claim rewards. That's it, three steps. Low gas fees for sure will be again one of the coolest features in CSM. In typical solutions, you need to spend a lot on gas if you solo stake with LSTs. With CSM, we propose to reduce it as much as possible. Only two interactions in the default flow, upload validator keys and claim rewards anytime for any amount of validators. Doesn't matter, cost will be the same and will be low. 
and to not to end up here, but to say LIDAR has a huge validator set, that's true. So why not to use it to align with Ethereum goals? Why not to, why not to make MEV burn, or I, some analogy of it, a bit closer to reality? With MEV smoothing, you wouldn't, take, you wouldn't need to care about different spikes in MEV and you getting or not getting this MEV. Your MEV rewards would look like this because MEV is socialized between all the validators and ST holders within LIDAR validator set. And the last thing here, the latest, coolest feature by far, there will be no additional tokens, no LDO, no LP tokens, no anything else, only ETH in form of ST ETH maybe. And that's it for bond and rewards. We think it, is, it makes sense to stay aligned with basic principles of Ethereum and basic principles of Ethereum validations involve nothing but ETH. That's the approximate timeline. So just to give you the gist, testnet somewhere around summer, mainnet release, proposal for mainnet release probably at the end of 2024. And what, is, what I want to ask you now, and that's crucial, since we revealed the proposal and it is not a final decision, you all here can make a change. If you think that something that I presented today makes no sense or might be improved, make sure to check out Research Forum proposal and leave your comments and leave your opinion so that we can make, together we can make CSM better. That's it. Thank you, Dmitry, for an amazing talk. So uh, we're left with the very last panel of the day. It's called When You Trust No One But Two of Three. And I uh, welcome panelists to the stage as soon as they are available. For now, we're just waiting. Let's welcome Max from Lido, Zahari from Metacraft Labs, Misha from uh, Nil Foundation, John from Succinct Labs, and Alex from Lido. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah, I'm Max. I'm a contributor for Lido, part of Analytical Workstream, and I'm really amazed to have these fantastic people here with me on panel. I'm kind of like the curious guy on this side, on ZK, so would be representing auditory as good as I can in terms of understanding the technology here. And my first question would be actually for Alex, who is also a contributor for LIDAR. 
uh, to provide a little context on like what is zk oracle technology how it's like emerged how it was proposed to dao and what are the next steps hello everyone i'm alex and uh, i'm core contributor of LIDA that um, occasionally responsible for the ZK Oracle integration into our protocol. And I am was not, will not be talking about ZK because I am not really an expert here. There is a guy that know a lot more. I um, will talk about the problem domain. Actually, we have this long-standing risk into our, in our protocol that was highlighted by various auditors and uh, the risk that the Oracle, which our protocol are based in, will bring us a wrong data. And um, I'll explain it in more details. Currently, we, uh, the protocol relies, trusts uh, a committee of nine oracles, uh, which are run by s reputable third parties, and uh, which are responsible um, um, of bringing uh, this data from the beacon chain that defines the protocol TVL. So it's a founding stone of our accounting. Uh, and right now, we just trust in them that, that they bring, do it honestly. Um, but with uh, EIP 4788, uh, we can implement uh, the trustless solution um, utilizing this ZK technology and uh, go to the trustless Utopia, <laughs> and but uh, it looks like it solves almost all our problems. Uh, we can build a board that uh, just delivers proof and the values to the protocol. We can trust um, trustlessly do it, and anyone can do it. But there's still real world around, and we have real world issues like reliability at first, uh, so this imaginable bot just can fail to, to deliver and goes down and um, even Facebook goes down sometimes. Uh, and uh, also, also we have um, some risks of bugs and vulnerabilities introduced into uh, all solution because it's very complex and um, not really intuitive thing. <laughs> uh, so um, we are proposing a solution for these problems. Uh, it's called multi-prover. Uh, actually, two out of three. Uh, so um, there are three different implementations of ZK Oracle will bring data on chain and uh, if data is equal and proofs are valid, we uh, will push it um, to, the, to the protocol, basically. And it will improve reliability, it will improve security, and so here we are with the guys uh, that, are, uh, that we co are collaborating with to provide uh, this solution. Thank you, Alex. That's fascinating. So, like, if I'm getting it right, like, no amount of security is enough, especially in terms of oracles who are responsible for like the major functionality of protocol, and like these amazing people are representing the teams that responded to like the call for improving security with like extremely like interesting and orthogonal tech of delivering the data to the protocol. If you are if we want to, and I would love to, could you, could you explain a little bit more how each of your teams are solving this problem? Um, maybe we could start with you, Hari. All right. Uh, I guess the basic idea is uh, obviously the same for all teams. Uh, we will leverage uh, EAP 4788 
this is the introduction of the beacon state route in the execution layer protocol. And now theoretically, uh, you have all the information to implement something similar to what we are doing in pure solidity uh, with Markov proofs. Uh, but the problem would be that this would consume way too much gas. So our teams are leveraging uh, zero knowledge technologies not to introduce secrecy or anything like that into the solution, but rather to compress the computation, to make it more efficient for verifying on chain. Uh, but basically the proof doesn't do something too complicated. Uh, Lido is a protocol where all the validators use the same withdrawal credentials. So basically we have a zero knowledge circuit that scans the entire set of validators. It locates the ones which are using the specific withdrawal credentials of Lido and it accumulates, uh, aggregates their balances on the chain. Uh, while doing this, you have to kind of make sure that um, private inputs are given to the input, which are kind of Merkle proofs, which are verified against the state, uh, known state route, and that's how you know that uh, the computation is completely authentic. That's fascinating, thank you. So, like, you're also working on, like, lowering the burden cost of transaction, of, like, making it even more efficiency on the Oracle that would be, like, the main, you know, fit thing with, with your technology? Yeah, this is one area where kind of the solutions of the different teams uh, differ to some extent. Um, this is coming from the fact that we are all using different uh, zero knowledge technologies. Yeah, yeah, that solution which is contributing to the security because um, one of the key idea why there should be multiple provers is that if any of the implementations uh, kind of somebody discovers a vulnerability of any sort or implementation bug, uh, then likely the other implementations wouldn't be affected because they are constructed in a different way. Okay, so if you can trust no one but two of three, let's ask to another guys. Misha, could you provide some info about you? All right, two out of three then. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's uh, the idea behind this whole project of ZK Oracle was, you know, initially it was born maybe like about a year ago or something. Uh, the first implementation of such an Oracle collecting all the validator balances, summing them up and then providing this information to the protocol to ensure that no TVL is, you know, reported wrong, which, you know, some... It, it reduces risks. It's like some risks, let's this way. And the first implementation was that about like an, a year ago by, you know, by, by the team, by the same team, we've built together the current version of the Oracle of ours. So what do we, what do we push for is that um, the security of such an Oracle actually I mean, if something's wrong with it, it can, you know, harm the entire industry. So we try to avoid this. And, uh, you know, as Zahari said, yes, we all use different tech. Uh, on our side, the tech we use is we try to do, instead of, you know, writing circuits manually, we try to write them with a high-level circuit compiler. So that makes them auditable. And, like, literally anyone in the industry can, you know, just take a look into that, uh, you know, audit and see that, okay, TVL is reported correctly, it's good, it's cool. So that's, um, that's like the primary purpose of this thing. So yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah, let's, I don't know, maybe the third opinion, so you could trust two out of three, huh? Thank you, yes, let's go, John. Yeah, so I think the multi-prover approach is actually something that I think we see in a lot of other disciplines in crypto. Um, specifically with like bridging, for example. I think, you know, in bridging, you also have this problem where you have these really important oracles that secure users' funds. And I think we're seeing that in, um, for example, bridging with like Gnosis Chain, they're also doing something similar where they have sort of like a N out of M sort of committee of different oracle providers and they're aggregating that to secure their bridge. And I think also with Uniswap's governance, um, they are doing something where they're proposing the idea of using multiple bridges to do cross-chain governance for Uniswap. And I think, you know, it makes a lot of sense that all these teams are kind of converging to the same philosophy of combining multiple oracles and aggregating their security. 
because you know there's so much um, money on the line here. I think in terms of um, our approach and how it is um, perhaps a little bit different from the other teams is um, we've been just building a lot of open source software um, for the past year um, for doing you know large scale analytics over on chain data. And I think you know just happened to be a good fit for a lot of the tools we've been building. And I think a lot of the tools we've been building makes it really easy for you know people on the Lido team themselves to implement the circuits. So I think that's more of the perspective that we're coming from. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all of you guys. It's really impressive, like in terms of um, general view of like adding new scale of the Oracle, I would say like problem, because we can like expand the set of trustful Oracle to like 90, 900, but uh, all of you solving the same like final issue of delivering information to protocol in orthogonal ways, like brings another level of security in terms of risks. That's really impressive. Yeah, can I add one thing? I think one interesting thing that maybe the crowd here may not understand is I don't think ZK is just like a matter of, you know, security of improving you know, the Lido Oracle. It also, I think, in the end game, will make, you know, Lido, people at Lido and their contributors, you know, their lives easier. Like right now, you guys are running this complicated Lido accounting Oracle committee, and you have to like find operators for it. You have to, you know, make sure the code is correct, which I guess is still true with ZK. But the magic with ZK is that now you don't have to go out of your way to get a bunch of people to run this Oracle for you. You can just trust the power of math. So I think it's not just a matter of security, like I think it also makes you know, Lido's operational needs easier in the limit. I think right now the ZK tech is still a little bit early, so this is not entirely true, but I think this is more and more, yeah, I would expect that ZK becomes more and more of an important technology that Lido will use. Thank you, John. Also, like echoing your story about magic of ZK, I have like, some personal thing here. I think three days ago I was calling my daughter, she's three years old, and she asked me to read her book. I didn't have a book in the halter room, so I pretended to read, read a book, reading the freaking menu, and come up with a story about the, the raccoon who find the magic ZQ coin, I don't know why, and then it got messed up. So guys, please help me. Could you provide, and I like, generally know that this is the most stupid question about ZK, like, could you provide the simple explanation of ZK? Maybe any of you? Like, come on for real? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to, don't, don't do this. It's... I think the simplest explanation for everyone in the audience with respect to Lido is just verifiable compute. You can just do as much compute as you want um, for around 200k gas, which is, I think, right now around like $10 in Ethereum. And I think, I don't have exact benchmarks off the top of the head, but I think to run the Lido Oracle in Solidity would probably cost on the order of like thousands of dollars, if not probably orders of magnitude more. So that's what ZK is getting you. I would say it's not always at that comes at that cost because that cost comes with additional security assumptions that you gotta trust. Uh, you know, a committee of those who did the trusted set of which I wouldn't say you can trust if you try to stake that amount of TVL. So you shouldn't trust that. I would say. And that was like an explicit requirement for this to be absent. So yeah, I guess the cost of the compute depends on what is best for a particular solution. So you want more security? Yes, it's like the verification cost of such a compute would be more expensive. It's like you can, I don't know, still rely on basically five out of nine oracles. Yes, you can, you know, pay less, but in general, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's a verifiable compute. Some people use it for uh, its blinding purposes, aka privacy use case. Some people use it for the sake of compression, computation compression, which is basically the second use case. It's all about it, that's it. Thank you for this. Really, do you wanna add something or pass on this? Well, I mean, these were pretty good uh, answers. I will bring the perspective of a compiler developer. For me, the ZK technology is like a new type of instruction set, a new target architecture that we can target in compilers. Thank you. So, like, 
continuing this discussion on uh, the three different solutions that would enhance the security of Oracle reporting, uh, is there any like, particular like, fascinating uh, problems any of your teams faced doing this, or it was like just a streamline, something that you want to share, that you want to discuss? Well, if you want to talk about some particular problems, then the size of a validator said you got approved is the problem. It's like, I don't know how many, like uh, seven hundred, se several hundred K, I don't know, don't let me lie, Zahari. It's like, I don't know, 800 K validators currently within the Merkle that, that's right. And that's quite a lot of computation, let's say this way. So trying to fold it somehow together, trying to make it work at all in general is um, effort consuming. And the more validators there is, I mean, until the proper EP gets accepted to increase the threshold for the amount of ETH staked, well, it's going to increase. And uh, yeah, that's going to be quite an effort to keep this contained within the proper limitations in terms of costs. I think there are also other kind of interesting problems. For example, the fact that uh, the Ethereum specification is not using uh, zero knowledge friendly hash functions, uh, but we have uh, kind of constructed a way to solve this problem by mapping uh, all the kind of hash roots produced on, uh, stored on the, in the beacon state to a much more efficient kind of hash system known as uh, Poseidon hash. Uh, and this is what uh, that this could, is a kind of incremental computation that you can do on the chip, but then it really speeds up the generation of each individual proof. Yeah, just to add to that, I think actually in the context of ZK, I think the, the Oracle that Lido wants is actually one of the most interesting applications that have ZK that would go into production if it were to go to production next year. And I think that's largely because of like what Misha and Sahari said, which is like the very large amount of data mm -hmm that we're dealing with is, is in many ways like unprecedented, I think, in my opinion, in the Ethereum ecosystem. So that's really interesting. Um, in, our, in, in our solution, and I think in both of your guys' solutions, the way you deal with the fact that it's very large is you have to parallelize a lot of the computation. And I think one contrast with a lot of the ZKL2s that um, we see, you know, ZKL2s are a very sequential computation, but in Lido it's a very parallel thing. So that's one pretty interesting part um, that I think requires technical innovation. If you want a little bit more on the parallelization, it's like don't forget about the proof generation liveness. Because, I mean, you got to be able to provide it like once and a half an hour or something, at least. So if it doesn't get provided, things might get, you know, south. Things might go south. So it's, you know, liveness. We tried to solve this with a thing we called proof market. I mean, like, just decentralized for this, like a protocol, but in general, liveness is important. I think, yeah, the proof market stuff in a really interesting uh, direction. I think ZK also in general is, in many ways, more friendly to liveness because, um, for example, right now with the Lido Oracle committee, right, the only people who can submit the Lido Oracle updates are the people in the committee, but with ZK, um, you know, assuming you can make it so anyone can submit a proof, then technically, as long as there's one you know, honest, capable party, you can sort of have liveness in your end application. So that's another really nice reason why it's amazing to use ZK instead of um, these committee-based approaches. Thank you, guys. Yeah, like, again, lattice size is a problem. That's true. But, I mean, like handling this magnitude stuff in terms of the number of validators, it's our 800s, it's... Uh, inspiring in terms of like demonstration the actual fascinating technology you're using and moving a little bit on uh, your points of like end game of anyone could like using uh, the technology to uh, send the information on LTV for example Alex would you mind like sharing some context on the vision how the like this system of trustless and and lots of different oracles would be handled like in nearest future and in the end game in just your opinion the DAO would vote and like provide its vision but could you give the side from the like entity 
interested in the mechanism uh, getting the most precise data as possible and as secure. Yes, actually, uh, right now we are at first stage of um, this implementation and uh, delivered data um, will be used uh, as a sanity check for the actual um, trusted Oracle committee. Um, because the, the current implementation will not include the, all the required data, for example, data for withdrawal decisions or execution layer historical data uh, that we are also based on. But it covers the most important part, uh, that one that takes most risks on it. So it's worth implementing even in this way. Also, uh, the current solution is not precise um, at 100% because it's uh, based on withdrawal credentials uh, and anyone can um, launch a validator with wider deposit credentials. I don't know if um, it will um, want to give away some ease to wider, for example. Uh, but, uh, so we have several uh, directions to improvement. Uh, we can Im imp we will improve pr precision and also we will improve the completeness of this report. So once we reach these goals, uh, we can be, uh, we will do the approach trustless, which uh, fulfills the requirement for dual governance, for example, to work. And uh, also, um, after that, we can utilize uh, this tech and these approaches in other um, parts of the system. Actually, there is several uh, other points that we can uh, improve using ZK technologies. Yeah, got it. So it's like gradually increasing, like not putting your trust on, like I generally believe amazing technology, but that's we're talking about LIDAR TVL, we want to be as secure as possible. And like on the next steps, could you guys share like what's what's like the short term plan like when we would see the Oracle actually submitting on maybe you have some like more forward looking ideas of implementing of like uh, of different, uh, you know, mutual projects with the DAO of further like implementing the tech you are experts all right, C development on our, our side definitely continues. Uh, we kind of want to address many of these uh, kind of issues that Alex mentioned, and we are also looking into other problems that can co kind of complement this report, such as one very interesting aspect, for example, is uh, can you detect poor validator performance? There is some validator that they have missed a block proposal or they have missed uh, their sync committee duties. Uh, Arguably, this is creates a lot of uh, kind of cost opportunity cost for the protocol. So, in bonded protocols, you could use the bond of the operator to compensate the stakers for such events. Uh, something that's important to note here is that um, even though we build this solution for Lido, our vision is that it really should be used in every liquid staking protocol. And what we have developed is. Uh, allowing us to do that, like it's developed as a public good. It's easy to integrate on our liquid staking protocols. We have also one different integration mode, which uh, is more suitable for liquid staking protocols with a smaller number of operators, or one such that doesn't use the same withdrawal credentials uh, for the entire validator set. Uh, then you can use uh, kind of Merkel accumulator for all the validators that you create, and the proof can be constructed against this market accumulator. That's what we support. Um, so development continues. Uh, we actually plan to go live on uh, the testnet pretty soon uh, with the first live adapter. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating, especially the thing you mentioned about like reporting, you know, actually performance data on each validator. It opens up um, sharing the information on like different entities, solving lots of principal agents problems with opening up the protocol. Like Dmitry have a talk on community staking initi initiative, sorry. And 
yes, uh, making the way to like share the information trustless and as precise as possible would definitely open up the new designs not only for LIDAR but for uh, the ETH. Do you guys want to share your plans, your visions? In terms of plans for this particular thing, I mean, the thing was deployed on Sepoila for, I don't know, a couple of months, like, already. So it's like, I don't know, you know, a couple of months already. So that's the thing. Uh, we're obviously, like, continuously improving that. And, uh, I don't know, just deployed to, like, the primary ETH of this oracle i mean you may or may not use it but like it's like it's it's about just reporting the data itself uh, is i mean going to happen i guess till the end of the month um most probably um most probably anyway i mean it's like it's primary ease deployment that's the thing the rest of it up to the audits and everything Regarding the plans for, you know, what this could be like of a use besides just, you know, TVL usage. Um, let's say this way, there are like quite an, quite some amount of use cases, quite some amount of uh, those things which in, in which um, security has to be threatened. I mean, yes, of course, like validator's performance is one of them. It's like another one is, I don't know, like for example, the risk, I don't know, depegging risk of something by measuring basically the liquidity available in the pools and automatic reporting of that, risk parameters of a validator being, of a, val of a particular validator being slashed or not, this kind of things as well. And the target, the target for us is to enable protocol developers to develop necessary provable computations for the protocol themselves because I mean otherwise just going to some third party team asking them to do this each time is simply you know not really comfortable for the protocol team. So the end game idea is to you know is to enable protocol developers to just use, you know, I don't know, some high level language, okay, like Rust or like CPP or something, and to develop proper strategies for proper risk parameters to be proven via this by themselves, instead of, you know, just going and poking some third-party team each time. So, because considering even I just, you know, made up some amount of these risks, and internally I guess there are much more guesses about what makes sense to be, you know, proven or not. So that's, you know, like, the end game for this particular like project on our side, I guess. Yeah, that's like, really fascinating in terms of like you know trimming the unnecessary costs of sharing information and giving and trimming the opportunities to actually like make it permissionless, make it risk managed by design or managed by the DAO, by the community, like trustful. That's I'm mean, generally it's I, I can, can't use this word. That's freaking inspiring. That's that's cool. John, um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I definitely want to echo Misha's point. Like, I think, yeah, right now, just frankly, the infrastructure and tooling around ZK is so bad that, you know, it really requires for Lido to collaborate with other, you know, teams that have ZK experience to make this work. But, like, yeah, frankly, like, I'm not the expert on liquid staking here, right? Like, you guys are. So it just makes way more sense that you guys would be implementing, you know, the core logic for the Oracle and not be required to talk to us to, you know, deploy the, you know, designer develop the circuit in a, in a circuit, which I think is why Misha is excited about the high level language approach. But I think, you know, even beyond the programming layer, there's just also not good infrastructure um, to use this stuff. You know, there's not good monitoring, there's not good explorers, there's not good um, cloud infrastructure to like paralyze the computation. And I think all these things are pain points that would go away in a few years. And you know, I'm really excited for that world as well. Thank you, John. So um, moving, moving forward, and again, it's kind of a tricky question, but I really generally uh, want to know what brings you guys and your teams for like, the technology of zero knowledge. Like, may, can you share the story of like, how you discover this New world and started like yeah that's that's good I should I should dive deep to, into this. Well, I, I think I learned about uh, zk even before I joined the blockchain chain space. Uh, it did it intrigued me to exactly as a kind of 
the fact that it's a general purpose verifiable computing. Uh, but this was kind of mostly curiosity back then. I was trying to understand, okay, what does it mean for a compiler engineer to target these systems? Um, but, and I'm lucky that uh, kind of my career allowed me to get to the point to work with this tech uh, many years later. Uh, yeah, that's really inspiring. <laughs> John, Misha. Um, for me, yeah, I think I came from a math CS background, and when I first came to crypto, I, you know, I thought a lot of the super financial stuff like staking, DeFi, and stuff was super interesting. But I think, you know, I was looking for something that was, you know, very technical and very technical and math heavy. And I think the ZK technology really spoke to me. I think I quickly understood that it would be a very big part of crypto's future. So I think that's why I'm still excited to work on it today, as well for the fact that I think, you know, it's going to make a lot of progress in the next few years. Thank you, John. That's, that explains why me with my economical background is mostly on staking. <laughs> Misha, you want to share something? No, oh, no problem. Alex, you want to tell us your personal story about the cave? It just happened several months ago <laughs> when I was thrown into this deep ocean of black voodoo cryptography to navigate it. And it's I, like it's like we made Losha dive into that, literally. <laughs> he had no other choice. Yeah, exactly. Let's show wink if you need help. <laughs> He's not winking. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, for coming here. Like, I think we covered all the topics that I have on this tiny piece of paper that I've dropped. If you want to share anything at all or discuss something, um, we have time. We have audience here. Um, so anything you want to bring up or we should wrap it out and go to the party. Yeah, thanks for organizing. This was a lot of fun. That's all I wanted to say. You can say it after the party. That was a lot of fun. I guess I should thank to the interesting panels before me because I was about to be late for this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were kind of good, but ours was the best. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. Thanks so much, guys. So a wonderful panel. Um, this concludes Lido Connect, um, the first ever Lido Connect. Again, if you have any feedback to us at Lido about anything that happened today, please tell us. We would like to hopefully do this again sometime in the future. Uh, and now uh, we are starting the after party. In fact, it's going to be a dinner uh, in a restaurant just next door. So to join the after party, you need to exit the building the same way you came in, exact same way. And then once you exit the building, you go a little bit to the left. It shouldn't take you more than one minute to reach the restaurant. It's next to a fountain in the garden over here. Uh, we will have food, drinks, hookah, Bosphorus view, some other things I wouldn't mention, but it will be amazing. So hope to see you all there and thank you again so much for coming. Thank <laughs> you.